to produce hemophosilica. For rector, we can use the prudence bed rector and rotary clones and produce hemophosilica. And chemical treatment, uh, there is alkaline treatment and acid leaching treatment. And for alkaline treatment, uh, they are heated at 1100 to 1200 degrees C and to produce crystalline silica. silica. For acid uh, leaching treatment, they are heated at 500 to 900 degrees C to produce homophosilica. The characterization of fiber ash. Scanning electron microscope, elect energy dis dispersive spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared TIR spectroscopy, X ray diffraction HRD are few of the analytical tools employed in analyzing fiber ash. Amuta 2010 used SEM to reveal the morphology of RHA with the particles having irregular shape and bearing in particle size with void form at some selected area as shown in figure two. So figure two shows this SEM morphology for the RHA, the left, you can see on the left hand side is an uneven space there and, and B is nano silica. We can see also the, the void there, I uh, mean circle by the red circle. FTRR, Fourier transform, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy is used to identify the functional group and the energy band associated with the fiber ash or silica based compound. X-ray diffraction HRD analysis is employed to reveal the crystallographic characteristic of a material as depicted in figure three. From the saline lattice, lattice some compound will be suspected to be present presence in the fiber ash. So this is the XRD pattern SWA and the SIO2NP samples. But you can see on the top one is the, the, the curve is for the silicon nanoparticles and the, the, bot, the bottom arrow show the sugar cane waste ash. Okay, energy dispersive uh, spectroscopy EDS assists in revealing the organic and inorganic element compound uh, presence in the fiber ash and their quantities in terms of weight percentage. The EDS confirm the most dominant element or compound in the fib fiber ash. Okay. This, this table shows the nominal plant-based natural fiber composition used as reinforcement. Uh, see, we have the, the different and uh, uh, plant and uh, and uh, with the uh, different natural fiber like GSA, RHA, BA, CSA, PKSA, BLA. So there are different uh, natural fiber with different content of uh, CO, CAO and SIO, Fe2O3, K2O and MGO, element Al2O3 and others. And they are taken from different, uh, different sources and we have compiled it. So this is show, show you know the the, the composition uh, for the various uh, natural fiber used for uh, reinforcement in composite. Okay, thermal gravimetric analysis (TGA) TGA is used to ascertain the thermal stability and degradation pattern of the fiber ash at various temperature. Synthetic reinforcement are neither cost effective nor environmentally friendly, reliant on the imp importance importation of synthetic material from overseas combined with a high cost of foreign exchange implies that the synthetic material uh, purchased locally are relatively expensive if available researchers have uh, researchers have shown interest in improving at the mechanical characteristic of aluminum metric composite amc by adding cheaper and natural fiber and agro waste as reinforcement researchers are constantly focusing on material advancement by exploring abundant natural fiber as a substitute substitute for synthetic material as in raising for enforcement in the fabrication of aluminum metric composite for weight reduction and improving mechanical properties through modification of the microstructure for automotive and aerospace application. Many factors have continued to play 
a leading role in utilizing natural fiber or synthetic material as reinforcement in AMC, including its availability, less dense nature, and cost effectiveness. Uh, the percentage addition of the reinforcement played a significant role in determining the mechanical properties of the composite. Furthermore, the size of the reinforcement has a significant impact on mechanical properties of the composite as shown in, in figure two. The smaller the reinforcement size, the higher the hardness, the tensile, the impact, the compressive, the creep, fatigue, strength, and vice versa. So this figure shows the effect of strength in relation to the particle size reinforcement. And uh, we can see that uh, the, the, the x axis is the particle size and uh, y axis is the strength contribution in megapascal. And, and the video. We see, you see the different curve this. for different cases, like, uh, like the green one used for Holland perch, and others use the Oro, Oro one EM mismatch, CTE mismatch, and load transfer, GOT, and the experimental data. Experimental data. Okay, uh, now I'm showing you the different natural fiber that are used uh, in the publication uh, of the, you know, they can be used for the publication of metal metric composite. So in this case, the abundant fiber utilized in the publication of aluminum metric composite in recent years, in recent years including rice husk, ground nut, locust bean pod, uh, palm shell Same kernel, uh, bamboo leaf, mm -hmm. uh, corn cob, basalt, shell, sugarcane bagas, millet husk, and she's uh, nut shell. So these are the pictures you know, of those rice husk, coconut shell, pumpkin shell, groundnut shell, locust bean pod, sugarcane bagus, and bamboo leaf and corn cob. The growing demand for lightweight material has stimulated researchers' interest in using aluminium alloy matrix composite for specific application. Aluminium metric composite are basically the most widely used material second to steel due to their unique combination of physical and mechanical characteristics which include low weight, excellent electrical and thermal conductivity, high strength, low coefficient of expansion, high specific stiffness, excellent thermal, thermal shock resistance and satisfactory corrosion resistance. So this is the uh, the matrix material and reinforcement and we can see the matrix here is aluminium reinforcement is from uh, plant-based natural fibers ash and we have we are also showing some you know references from where we the, the similar work has been carried out so and the plant fiber natural fiber that, that reported to be used include rha ccca csa I mean the BLA, PTSA, GSA plus HFA, LBWA, BA, and CFA and BA. Okay, uh, the most common method employed in the publication of aluminum metric composite are squeeze casting, stir casting, compo casting, fiber st uh, stir cast, friction stir casting, and powder technique. Among the various route investigated, researchers discovered stir stir casting to be the simplest, the most convenient, and easy processing with adequate uh, flexibility, uh, better homogeneity, and the most profitable in terms of large scale production. So we can see the publication publication route, a liquid using liquid roots and solid state roots. And for liquid state roots, uh, state roots we have uh, the publication process like stir casting, uh, stir casting, squeeze casting, compo casting, and spray casting. Whereas for the solid state roots, we can use the diffusion bonding and powder metallurgy. These are the area of application of aluminum metric com uh, composite. So on the left hand side, we see the connecting rod, you know, and met met motorcycle pedal rest, motorcycle hand lever, car wheel, and piston. Some of this uh, application, you know, it is ordinary application, but you know, it can be. I mean, the the selection of material, you know, can be based on the aluminium metric composite because of the 
characteristic that they offer. Okay, many researchers investigated the impact of reinforcement on the mechanical properties of a 2009 metric composite. Al Qadir and Salim in 2017 publicated a 2009 fly ash metric composite via the casting and found improvement in the tensile strength and hardness as seen in this figure below with a decrease in wear rate, density and elongation as the fly ash addition increase as shown in this figure. You can see that on the left hand side, figure 4 is the variation of weight percentage of fly ash particulate on tensile strength and hardness and the bottom line is on the blue one is on the tensile on the hardness and the tensile strength on the top one so i think the, this material is okay this material are okay and because they have the required quality you know to qualify for certain application so the figure five is the variation of width of the fly edge particulate on language elongation and wear rate and uh, we have on the x axis is uh fly as width versus the language elongation wear rate in y axis that uh for the for instance the wear rate as the fly as increase the wear rate is decreasing is decreasing i in 2019 employed uh bin pot ash particles as enforcement to publicate a 2009 metric composite via double stir casting and reported an increase in hardness and tensile strength as their weight fraction of the had been had been put as increased despite the fact that double stir casting technique uh, improved the weightability overcoming is it remain uh, a challenge however by using the vortex method in the development of aluminium metric composite and uh, this problem can be solved Okay, the challenges and option for the future. Material scientists are currently focusing on low cost, high performance engineering component. The researchers are devoting their precious time, resources and expertise to improve the effectiveness of reinforcement material for the production of aluminum metric compound. Among them are let's see, most of the microstructure of stir casting, stir cast aluminum metric composite reveal non-homogeneous enforcement material distribution and weightability. As a result, heating of the reinforcement metal prior to the, its addition into the molten aluminum alloy can improve weightability, which will further lead to uniform distribution of reinforcement particle, thereby exchanging, enhancing the mechanical properties due to good bonding. Most casting are associated with a casting defect such as porosity. This can be reduced by adding the oxidizer such as hexachloroethylene. So now we want to focus on the actual work that we carried out in, in Indonesia, which is on using the sugar palm or aringa pinata, which is a multifunctional species of palm belonging to the palmia, uh, palmia family that can be used to produce a variety of, of food and beverages, uh, wood food stock, feed stock, fingers, uh, fibers, uh, biopolymer, and biocomposite. Sugar palm is a tall, large uh, palm tree found at an altitude of 1,400 uh, meter above the sea level, which is a single unbranched trunk that can grow up to 20 meters in height and 75, 75 centimeter in diameter in areas with 500 to 1,200 uh, centimeter cube of rainfall. So, sugar palm fiber, popularly, popularly known as injo, is found in the tropical south and southeast Asia, including in Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Philippines, uh, Papua New Guinea, North Australia, Thailand, Burma, and Vietnam. So you can see on the right hand side we have the sugar palm plant, uh, sugar palm plant, and the and also the sugar palm fiber, the black in color that normally surround the, the, the trunk of the sugar palm. Okay, the materials and methods. So LM26, aluminum alloy and sugar palm fiber, uh, the preparation of sugar palm fiber. Ash 
is as shown, we have sugar palm fiber and we carry out the carbonization process and calcinization process at 700 degrees C for five hours. And finally, we get sugar palm fiber ash, uh, SPFA. Okay, material and method. So the X-ray, X-ray flu fluorescent of SP, SPFE constitu constituents, uh, uh, C this consume of the is a sil SiO2, CaO, Fe2O3, Al2O3, K2O, TiO2, MnO, ZnO, and others. And uh, well, the ma ma mass fraction is 33.49, and for SiO2, 23.56 20, for COO, etc. So the refractory content uh, from this uh, material is 88%. The XRF results show SPFA has high amount of hard refractory ceramic material in the form of, of oxide. The presence of this hard refractory ceramic oxide in agricultural ways such as SiO2, F2O3, O3 and Al2O3 is responsible for their use as enforcing material in AMC. Okay, this is the publication process of the aluminum uh, composite. So we start with uh, sugar palm ash and then we do the HRF and HRD and then preheating of sugar palm uh, fiber ash uh, at uh, 500 degrees C for four hours. And we carry out the degassing and we put the, the, uh, the degassing agent in this uh, stir casting with aluminum to LM26 aluminum alloy. And then what we get is a composite LM26 aluminum and also 0 to 10 percent uh, sugar palm fiber ash compost and to form the composite and then we test the physical and mechanical properties so the stir casting roots of publication of this composite is shown here we have the uh, mold there the stirrer there and heating coil stirrer blade molten aluminum matrix and graphite crucibles and preheated uh, plant based natural fiber reinforcement uh, is for is added inside that uh, the container. So uh, result and discussion: the density of LM twenty six aluminium metric composite decreased from two point seven one gram per centimeter cube, with a uh, two percent weight of uh, sugar palm fiber ash to two point five seven gram per centimeter cube, with a uh, ten percent. Sugar palm uh, uh, the fiber ash addition. The decrease in density could be attributed to the SPFA less dense nature. Uh, this demonstrated a uh, possibility of producing light with aluminumetric composite with SPFA for low energy consumption in automotive application. The amount of air trap in the composite during the stir casting is responsible for the increase in porosity. The developed compost composite percentage porosities were found to be lower than the maximum permissible limit of 4% for aluminum matrix composite, which confirmed SPFA uh, to be suitable for the pro in the production of LM26 aluminum matrix SPFA composite. So we see the figure variation of density and porosity of LM26 aluminum matrix with sugar palm fiber as particle. So we have the you know the x-axis, the SPFA width, and on the right hand side, the y-axis the percentage poros uh, porosity, and the left hand side is density in gram per centimeter cube. So we'll find that you know as the uh, content of the fiber increase. And the density increase but the uh, porosity decrease okay the this is the figure for variation of tensile and compressive strength with the uh, different width for sugar palm fiber as addition so as we add the sugar palm uh, ash into this into the composite we find the strength in tensile and compression strength they increase to some extent and, and after it it percent it is slight decrease slightly. The tensile strength and compression strength increase with the increase in SPFA content addition into LM26 aluminum alloy. The increase in tensile strength and compression compressive strength could be due to the uniform distribution of SPFA in the matrix of the 
aluminum alloy which which hinder uh, which hinder the uh, dislocation and excellent uh, interfacial bonding that was formed between the matrix and the reinforcement SPFA. The optimum tensile strength and compression strength value of 160.7 megapascal and 275 megapascal respectively was achieved with an 8% weight by weight addition of sugar palm fiber ash. The tensile strength and compression strength dropped at 10% uh, by weight for sugar palm uh, fiber ash addition due to the formation of agglomeration of agglomeration of SPFA which led to weak bonding between the metric and reinforcement. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, see this figure show the variation in hardness value with the sugar palm uh, fiber ash uh, by percent percentage uh, addition. So the hardness value of sugar palm uh, fiber ash reinforced LM26 aluminum metric composite increased the addition of SPFA content from 0 to 10 uh, uh, percent as depicted in the, the in the figure and when compared to the LM26 aluminum alloy the hardness of the fabricated LM6 aluminum metric composite with uh, 10 percent sugar palm uh, fly ash uh, the fiber ash increased by 43.12 percent the presence of hard uh, refractory oxides such as SiO2, CaO, Fe2O3, and Al2O3 in the SPFA and the strong bond form with the LM26 aluminium metric could explain the increase in hardness with the SPFA addition. We can see in this figure that as you add more weight and the hardness increase, keep on increasing. Okay, uh, I think I'm towards the end of my lecture. So uh, I would like to conclude. The stir casting technique was used in this study to produce an LM26 aluminum metric composite with reinforcement SPFA. The effect of on the physical and mechanical characteristic of the fabricated composite was investigated. As a result of the study, the following results were obtained. Number one, sugar palm fiber ash contain a large amount of hard refractory ceramic materials such as SiO2, F2O3, and Al2O3. The ash may be responsible for high tensile strength and hardness when added to the aluminum alloy. The density of the fabricated composite decreased by 5.2%, implying that a lightweight composite could be produced utilizing sugar palm fiber uh, ash particle. The percentage of porosity of the composite was uh, less than the maximum allowable limit of 4%, indicating that the tensile compression and hardness values will be high. And finally, the addition of sugar palm fiber ash particle to the LM26 aluminum alloy increased tensile strength, compressive strength, and hardness to the maximum value of 100 and 60.69 megapascal, 273.73 megapascal, and 80.91 HB respectively at 8% uh, percent by weight of sugar palm uh, fiber ash addition. So I would like to thank uh, University Putra Malaysia, our university, for the financial support via the research grant GP IPS uh, 2021. Uh, num number set 9702700 and this is some of the references that we are, that we use in the in this uh, in this research and uh, there, there are a lot of references and 20 26 reference 29 reference here and with that, with that uh, ladies and gentlemen i would like to thank you for your kind attention uh, if you have any question you know you can ask me or you can always uh, you know contact the secretary to contact me you know and i can explain to you uh, whatever is the, the doubt that you have or any inquiry that you want to make just always repeat to me thank you so much thank you very much dr supon it was a very informative talk for our research society uh, we have one question from dr khubab 
uh, he is asking can the chopped sugar palm fibers serve the same purpose and what problems can erase during fabrication of fiber reinforced aluminum matrix composites Dr. S uh, Dr. Spawn, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, the the first the second question, uh, the the second question about the problem in fabrication, and uh, we found that the, the agglomeration, agglomeration, agglomeration you know, of the of this uh, ash, you know. So we just try to, I mean the use the mixer the good mixer uh, good mixing is, is very important and the first question is about the chop uh what's uh, the first question then i cannot quite clear hello can, can you hear me yes yes we can hear you yeah yeah the, can you repeat the first question Sugar palm fibers serve the same purpose. Chop fiber, yeah. This one is a. You mean you're talking about chop fiber and and compare with the ash, right? Yeah, I, I think it cannot be the same. The ash has got yeah the bonding problem with the chop fiber, but I mean for the particle one for the ash one, it's got better bonding. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Swan. Uh, hope, yeah, Dr. Uh, hope Dr. Khubab got his answer. Thank you very much again, yeah. Dr. Thanks for the invitation then. So uh, our next guest is Dr. Azam. He is scientific researcher at University, uh, Technical University of Libras, Chazia. He published 39 research papers. His area of interest is smart textiles, green composites, functional polymers, and aerogels. He will talk about silver-plated stretchable elastomeric electrodes for electrotherapy applications. It's over to you, Dr. Azam. You can start now. Thank you very much, Dr. Zikriya. Uh, so I have shared my screen. Uh, is it? Are you watching it? Yes, Hello. yes, we okay. can see. Okay, so the topic uh, I'm going to present is the silver plated stretchable elastomeric electrodes for the electrotherapy applications. Actually, the electrotherapy is a kind of physiotherapy uh, to reduce the uh, pain in muscles and, and to enhance the healings. So for this purpose, there is a specific instrument known as the transcutaneous electrical nerve simulation device. This device is attaching with some electrodes uh, as in case of we, we can see like, like ECG and electromyography devices. Actually, uh, there is demand for the flexible electrode nowadays going to be increased because of their flexibility and stretchability. And for if they are plated with some metal particles, so they will give the antibacterial effect and also uh, to avoid from the other pathogens. They are washable and reusable. They can be attached to the multiple devices like electrocardiography, electromyography, transcutaneous electrical simulation device. The researchers have been developing different types of electrode with different techniques and, e and each technique was having its own limitations. For example, if they are using the carbon rubber electrodes, they were giving the sc some skin dermatitis uh, problems. If the electro electrodes with the gels and metal particles, so again, they were more toxic and reusable uh, and they were uh, skin irritants. Needle electrode, then they need to be inserted into the body and they were creating some skin problems. Self adhesive electrode with various structures, they were again giving some problems regarding the re redness, rashes, and other uh, skin dermatitis. Inorganic antibacterial agents, for example, if nanoparticle they were using, so th there's a lack of the ability to chemical interaction with the textile absorbent and poor washing and rubbing property like this. So the here are some problems they have been associated with the uh, researcher electrodes. 
so th these are the our lectures which we have prepared actually the motivation was we have fabricated the electrodes with the combination of silicon elastomer and carbon particles subsequently like uh, silver electroplating was done over these electrodes to avoid from the and uh, the pathogens and they have given the antipathogenic properties like the antibacterial antiviral etc the morpho then we have uh, observed their uh, morphological properties and uh, the main thing is that our uh, work will will provide the stretchable electrodes with antipathogenic properties the and they are quite comfortable regarding the stretchability and they are safe to fit with the skin there are some materials which we have used like the silicon elastomer and carbon particles and silver nitrate for making the uh, silver electroplating over it at first we fabricate the conductive electrodes uh, by imparting the carbon particles in different with co different concentrations into the silicon rubber and in the second steps after making these conductive electrodes they were put into the electrochemical bath and silver plating was done over it here is the brief design uh, experiment of our prepared electrodes with different concentration of carbon particles and with different electroplating time there are some characterization techniques regarding the surface characterization then then some anti uh, pathogenic properties and then the durability of these electrodes after imparting the carbon particles into the silicon elastomer we check the ftir and there are some peak additional peaks which are providing the which which are the justification of carbon particles here we can see the scm analysis of the embedded carbon particles elastomer this is after the like silver electroplating and and their respective eds spectra the justification of carbon particles and silver was done by the xrd analysis so here are some peaks which are associated with the carbon and silver we have checked their electrical resistivity and we can see that by as we are increasing the concentration of carbon particles the electrical resistivity is going to be decreased furthermore as the more electroless electroplating on it silver electroplating so the resistivity was going to be more decreased as i have already told you that these electrode will be used as a, as an electrode with, uh, with that tens machine so they are testing regarding the at different stretch percentage and uh, we have to check their electrical resistivity uh, we can see that up to the 75% stretch they can withstand easily and after the stretch 75% stretch there was some uh, decrease in the like tremendous electrical resistivity we also give the multiple stretch and release properties of these electrodes and we can check that uh, th there are there is a, a insignificant increase in the electrical resistivity even more than 71 cycles there is a change in the resistivity with a constant current electrodes were attached with the uh, with the twice of the transcutaneous electric simulation and the constant current was given in milliampere and then we can see that the resistivity was maintained even it is attached with the device at the end uh, we also find their antibacterial properties of these electrodes before and after washing and we can see that the uh, samples which uh, 10 lemon and 12 they were prepared with the 8 gram of carbon particles with maximum amount and maximum and maximum electroplating times was given on these and they have given us good uh, antibacterial properties and also very less electrical resistivity and there is insignificant decrease in the electrical uh, sorry uh, antibacterial properties even after the sphere washing antifungal properties are also associated with these electrodes we have checked as they have given uh, good anti uh, fungal properties we can conclude that we have produced less stiff flexible hygienic electrodes having extraordinary antibacterial properties with good comfort properties silver electroplating plating was enhanced to uh, to enhance the electrical conductivity and to give the antipathogenic properties
So we have developed the orderless work, work wear with less cost and easy preparation. The benefits of these electrodes and they are less stiff, better washing and rubbing fastness. They are less costly and simple. So the promising application of these electrodes are associated with the medical devices like, like electromyography, electrocardiography, and transcutaneous electrical nerve simulation device. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Azam. Uh, we have one question. Was yes, the yes. mixing of nanoparticle homogeneous? Uh, actually, it is uh, not uh, nanoparticle. It is the, the electroplating of silver in, in electroplating bath. I can show you here. Yes. At first, we prepared the uh, we, we embedded carbon particles into the silicon elastomer. Then we have made the conductive elastomer and this conductive elastomer were attached with the cathode of the electroplating bath and silver nitrate was used as an salt in it and then we have give the uh, potential source uh, out uh, from outside and the silver was going to be accumulated over these electrodes so it was not in in the nano it was just a coating so it was homogeneous coating because as the, the uh, under layer of the carbon carbon particle is if is it uh, homogeneous and uh, proper homogenized conductive then the silver uh, will be accumulated over it as a homogeneous layer Thank you very much, Dr. Azam. Uh, you presented your topic very well, and uh, you can close your presentation. Thank you very much. My third presenter is Dr. Zahurullah. He is an assistant professor at Queen University, Belfast, UK. His area of interest is computational solid mechanics, impact modeling, damage fracture mechanics, and hybrid composites, metallic joints. Today, he will talk about structural applications of fiber reinforced polymer composites in maritime applications. Over to you, Dr. Zahurullah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction. Um, uh, so hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Zahurullah. Uh, I'm from the Advanced Composite Research Group uh, in the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Queen's University, uh, Belfast in the U UK. Um, and uh, these are my uh, co-authors, so uh, including uh, Scott Mellon, uh, Tommaso, uh, and uh, Levan. So these uh, are our uh, postdocs. And we have a PhD student, um, uh, Muhammad Burhan, uh, and uh, we also have a, a, a co-PI, uh, Brian Falzon. So uh, today I will be presenting uh, mainly about the application of the uh, fiber reinforced polymer composite in uh, maritime applications. So uh, the project that I'm working on uh, is mainly about the uh, uh, the decarbonization of maritime transportation, uh, a return to commercial sailing. Uh, so, uh, Belfast Maritime Consortium, which was led by Artemis Technologies, uh, so we won uh, this um, uh, UKRI uh, project, uh, which was about uh, 60 million uh, uh, pound, uh, and the project aim was to develop uh, the zero emission hydrofoiling uh, ferries, uh, which you can see in these figures. So we already uh, working uh, with them on these type of boards. And the main difference between these and, uh, and conventional boards is that these boards can uh, fly over the water. So as you can see, uh, when it's uh, uh, the boat, we have these uh, wing type structure. So when uh, this boat reach a certain speed, then it can uh, fly over the water. And these are uh, uh, fully uh, made of composite materials because we want to reduce the weight. Uh, and these are fully electric. So that's why um, uh, it will uh, uh, reduce um, uh, environmental uh, uh, effects. And as you can see, uh, a comparison of two uh, boards in this figure. So this is the one which is based on this design, and this is the conventional one. And you can see the uh, uh, because it's flying over the water, so the weight behind it is very minimal, and that's why it will provide a very, uh, very uh, comfortable uh, ride. Okay, so um, 
at Queen's University, we are uh, part of this consortium and we are working on different topics. Uh, so the first topic that I would like to uh, give a brief introduction is about the uh, use of 3D woven composites and then it's um, uh, low velocity impact and then compression after impact uh, 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 results. Uh, so the first thing is why we want to use a 3D woven composite. So because um, as compared to the unidirectional and uh, 2D woven composites, so these composites, which is 3D woven composites, uh, so it provide better interlaminar mechanical properties because we have yarns uh, in all three um, orthogonal directions uh, and we can have near net shape uh, textile preform and we can also have single step uh, free from fabrication. Now, <clears throat> I will just um, uh, give a brief um, idea of what exactly we are doing uh, as part of this project. So um, as you can see in this figure here that we are using uh, uh, this layer to layer interlock, uh, which is a type of 3D woven composites. And we uh, creating, for example, like a four whipped yarns, uh, which is in this direction and uh, three layers of uh, warp yarn, which is in this direction here. Uh, and we can see that this is the model that we generate in Qubit, uh, which is uh, an open source um, uh, CAD software, which you can use uh, for free. And then we, um, do the compaction simulation uh, in finite element software, uh, which is what we call is Abacus. Uh, so initially this was the geometry and then we uh, apply pores on it and then we try to compact it. And as you can see, it uh, look like this. And we are doing this because uh, this is um, what we are getting uh, at the end of our manufacturing uh, uh, process. Uh, so again, this is the whole process which is given here. So we create the geometry, then we do the compaction then we uh, create a final uh, geometry for the um, uh, impact simulation and also for the uh, 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 compression after impact simulation. And we are, why we are doing uh, this impact simulation because these boards are, um, uh, you know, can be um, subjected to different type of impacts. For example, a fish can uh, hit it or maybe um, an ice block inside the water can hit the board. So we want to know what will happen um, uh, as an effect of that impact. Now, this is um, uh, our, um, uh, uh, one of the study that we are doing here. So as you can see that this is the um, finite element model that we created here. Uh, so in this case, it's a 150 by 100 uh, uh, meter plate. Uh, and this is made of uh, this uh, 3D woven composites. And this is the experimental uh, part which was conducted by our uh, uh, our. Uh, project partners, um, uh, University of Ulster. Uh, and as you can see that uh, here we are using two energies. Uh, so one is 32 joule, one is 42 joules. Uh, and as you can see that we are um, impacting it with this impactor. So the diameter of the impactor is about 16 millimeter and mass is about uh, 4.3 kilogram. So we want to see what will happen to this, uh, uh, this uh, <clears throat> uh, plate uh, as a result of this impact. Um, and the way we're doing it in uh, finite element software Abacus that we are using different damage models. So we can model the delamination between the uh, two layers. Uh, and then again, we uh, also then need to model the intralaminar damage. So then we can, uh, we should model the uh, fiber dominated damage. So as you can see in uh, tension and compression, and then we should also um, uh, model the uh, fiber uh, or the matrix dominated damage. Uh, so in this case, it can either be due to uh, tension or compression or can be due to shear. And then we also need to model the, uh, the nonlinear shear response of the metrics. So our model incorporate all these um, models together. And as you can see, this is the um, result of uh, the force time, uh, the force time and uh, the force displacement plot. So for, uh, the force time means that if we uh, hit the uh, the composite block uh, with uh, with this uh, impactor. Uh, so what will happen to the force uh, is a function of time. So this is this is what is happening. So the 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 black one is the uh, experimental results, and then the red one is the uh, finite element results here. Uh, and as you can see, both are matching very well. And the uh, and this is again for the displacement. Uh, so this is for the thirty two joule, and this is for the forty two joules. So we can see that our results uh, matching very well uh, with the uh, simulation results. Uh, and similarly, these are the absorbed energy. So again, comparison of the simulation and experimental results. So again, we can see that uh, this red, which is our simulation and the gray one uh, is from the experiment. So both are matching very well. Uh, 
uh, and these are the uh, uh, impacted areas, uh, the damage area. So as you can see on the top side and on the bottom side, and again, as you can see in this figure that there is only two uh, and 6% difference between the two. So this means that again, it's very, very accurate. And again, these are the uh, different cross section at different location. Um, uh, and again, this is comparison of the experimental results and the simulation results. And you can see that both are matching very well. And again, this is the, um, um, because as a result of impact that we want to see what will happen uh, to that composite. So for example, if then you apply uh, a compression force on the uh, damage composite. So then this is what will happen. So this is the, again, the experimental results and this is the uh, 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 finite element or numerical results. And you can see both are matching very well. And this is the compression after impact uh, strength. Uh, and again, the red one is the uh, uh, simulation result and the gray one is the uh, experimental result uh, for both energies, for 30, 32 joule and for 42 joules. And again, we can see that they both are matching very well. So in addition to this, we then uh, try a uh, different type of bind binder yarns uh, geometry. So this is the compacted one. This is the uh, the one with the rectangular cross section, and this is one with the elliptical cross, -se cross section. Um, and again, uh, you can see that um, by changing the uh, cross section and the geometry of the binder yarns, uh, we can see that the response is changing. So this means that the compaction one is the one which provide the most accurate result. And again, this is um, uh, some uh, study that uh, we can also change the, uh, uh, the, the, the stiffness of the different uh, layers. Uh, okay, so in this uh, second part, I would like to give a brief introduction about uh, the another type of um, uh, laminate, which is uh, what we call is double-double. Um, so as you know that the, uh, this double-double laminate, uh, which was proposed by Professor Stephen Sai, uh, and it can replace the uh, legacy quad laminate. So legacy quad laminate is the conventional uh, laminate, uh, which consists of uh, 0, 90, and plus minus 45 orientations. Uh, and this um, uh, new uh, sort of uh, laminate, which consists of only two set of angles. So for example, in this case, as you can see that it's uh, plus pi and then uh, uh, plus a psi uh, and minus uh, uh, pi and minus psi. So this will be like a two, uh, combination of two angles. So this will be like a sublaminate and then we can uh, we can replace. So for example, this type of laminate, which is 0, 45, 90, and uh, 45 symmetric, we can replace this by just plus minus 22 and plus minus 67. Uh, and then we can add this like a four or five or uh, um, as many times that you want. So again, we are doing um, uh, impact simulation here and then the compression after impact simulation. Uh, and again, in this case, we are using this um, uh, this specimen here that uh, we took it from the from the literature uh, from this paper here. Uh, and again, you can see that before going uh, to uh, so as as you can see that uh, in this case, first we are uh, uh, comparing the uh, results uh, with the legacy quad uh, laminate, and as you can see that uh, this is the um, force time uh, for the experimental uh, and simulation. Uh, uh, and both are matching very well. And again, this is the compression after impact response. And you can see both are matching uh, very well here. Um, and again, here then uh, for this uh, legacy quad, we are uh, based on different designs. Uh, we creating different um, uh, laminates. So one is this one and one is uh, this one here. Uh, and again, then we are comparing the response of these different double-double uh, laminate with the conventional uh, legacy quad laminate. Uh, and we can see that these double-double uh, laminate uh, provide good result as compared to the legacy quad. Um, and again, here uh, we are even then changing the double-double uh, the uh, to this design here. So this one was zero and plus minus uh, 42. And this one is what we call is the scatter design. So the scatter design even uh, provide better results than the uh, than this um, uh, this design here, uh, and again uh, this plot here shows us the uh, what what happened uh, after the impact, the the damage areas or the delamination areas. So this is what happened in the case of the conventional uh, laminate. So this is the uh, after impact, and this is after the uh, compression after impact test. Uh, so this is this is the simulation results, and this is this is what happened in the case of these uh, uh, double double. So we can see that in case of double double, the uh, damage area is less as compared to the conventional one. So this means that this um, 
double-double uh, 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 provide better results as compared to the conventional legacy quad. Um, and uh, finally, this again, uh, comparing the uh, the two type of double-double, uh, uh, so the one, the scattered one, and the one uh, which is uh, this just, just with the two angles. And again, we can see that this design, uh, which is this uh, response, so it's providing more strength as compared to this one. Um, and finally, as you can see that in this case, even we can uh, remove some uh, uh, some layers uh, from the double double uh, as compared to the uh, the legacy quad. And even if you uh, with a with a less thickness, even we can still get a a good strength, uh, which is even better than this, uh, which is the legacy uh, the legacy quad one experimental results. Um, and um, so I will skip this part. So uh, just just five. Uh, Finally, I want to say that um, uh, we are hosting this uh, ICCM. Um, uh, ICCM uh, 23 in Belfast um, in uh, in July August. So you are all uh, all welcome uh, welcome there. So thank you very much for your uh, listening. And if there is any question, uh, just please let me know. Thank you very much. Uh, very com comprehensive talk by Dr. Zahurullah. Uh, you explained your topic very well, and uh, I have one question: How do you get a well impregnated three D uh, reinforced composite? How I get what? Impre impregnation. Um, so uh, the thing is that, uh, um, like in our case, we are only working on the um, uh, finite element part or uh, uh, computational part or the simulation part of it. And then uh, we have project partners, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, mainly Ulster University uh, uh, in Belfast in the UK. So they are mainly working on the experimental side of it. Um, so, so, so they are mainly uh, expert in this area. So my, my main uh, uh, research is only about the simulation part. So uh, I'm not working on the uh, experimental part. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Hello everyone. I am Ikra Abdurishi from the Department of Materials. I am the co-chair of this session. Now my fourth presenter is Mr. Mehmet Kapoor Kopar. He is PhD researcher at Bursa University, Turkey. His field of interest is automotive engineering. His topic of presentation is determination of mechanical properties of carbon and glass fiber reinforced thermoplastic composites produced by heat pressing method. It's over to you, Mr. Mehmet. Hello? Yes, Mr. Mehmet, we can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so shall I share my presentation? Yes, you can. Okay, just hold on a second. Okay, just a moment. So can you see full screen? Yes. Uh, okay, so hello everybody. Uh, I just wanna give a brief about myself. My name is Mehmet Kopar. I'm a PhD candidate at Bursa Ola University in uh, automotive engineering department. And my field of expertise is artificial intelligence, AI, and also I'm working on composite materials. Uh, so, uh, and also I am a, a Research Fellow for the 2244 Industrial uh, Fellowship Program of Tubitak. Uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, determination of mechanical properties of carbon and glass fiber reinforced thermoplastic composites produced by heat pressing method. Uh, I'm also working with Professor Dr. Mehmet Karhan and also um, Maziar Ahrari and also uh, Abdullah Umur Jr. Uh, as a team. So uh, the contents of my uh, presentation uh, is abstract introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion and conclude. So in order to start, uh, I, I wanna say that uh, the uh, materials with superior mechanical and technological properties are needed in industries, uh, especially such as automotive, uh, aerospace, defense, traditional materials, such as copper, iron, steel, uh, uh, actually cannot meet uh, the need uh, in the industry. 
so as a result, the studies carried out in recent years and composite materials with superior and extraordinary mechanical and physical properties have been developed. So these composite materials uh, have started to be used and to be applied in many industries due to their high strength and lightweight properties. Uh, also, the natural zinc, uh, hemp, sea salt, uh, and also synthetic uh, fibers such as glass, carbon, and polyester uh, are uh, being used as reinforcing elements. Uh, so uh, actually in this uh, study, the polypropylene uh, PP fabrics uh, reinforced with carbon fiber and glass fiber were cut into 50 cross 50 centimeter sizes. These uh, plates were produced using the heat pressing method uh, by placing the uh, cut fabrics on top of each other in a such a way that there were uh, 10 uh, layers of fabrics actually. So uh, this uh, plate is uh, first used for uh, 300 seconds uh, during production. And also uh, the pressure was set to 50 bar and the second cycle take about 300 seconds at a pressure of 100 bar. And the last uh, cycle was for 120 seconds. So, uh, and the pressure was set to 120 bars. Uh, the, uh, during the, product, uh, the production of glass fiber reinforced uh, composite plate, uh, we had the first cycle for 300 seconds, the pressure 20 bar, second cycle 300 seconds, the pressure was set to 50 bars, and also finally, uh, at the third step, we had 120 seconds at 80 bar pressure. Uh, then, uh, after the production of plates, the samples were suddenly cooled. So these composite plates uh, and also the production was completed. Uh, the plates were cut to the specified standards in order to make the and perform the tensile and also charty ESO uh, investigations. So according to the tensile results, uh, the tensile strength of the carbon fiber reinforced composite was determined to be uh, 301.44 uh, megapascal, and the tensile strength of the glass fiber reinforced composite was determined to be 233.619 uh, uh, megapascal. Uh, and due to the isotropy test results, uh, the impact energy of carbon fiber reinforced uh, was measured as 49.14 uh, kilojoule per uh, square meters. And the impact energy of glass fiber reinforced sample was about 48.14. So uh, actually the mechanical strength per unit weight of carbon fiber reinforced uh, is tend to be larger than that of steel or aluminum. Uh, and also which reduce the energy consumption during operation. So the carbon fiber reinforced thermoplastics uh, abbreviated as CFRTP uh, in which thermoplastic resin is impregnated into the fibers uh, are most uh, advantageous and are more advantageous in terms of productivity over short time periods. So in this regard, establishing viable production processes for CFR TPs is an important issue, uh, is an important task actually. So uh, the production of these materials using continuous carbon fibers is especially important as such materials have high mechanical properties, such as high flexural strength and also high tensile strength. So uh, stamping or heat pressing uh, actually are, in, in order to form these materials, such as the, prop, the um, process similar to metal forming, uh, are uh, suitable to consume time and make the uh, processing time even shorter. So, uh, actually, they are not uh, well developed in order to have longer term use and are not used in practical industries. So this study especially focuses on heat pressing using CFR TT sheets. Uh, and uh, these uh, processes also involve heating the sheet above the melting point of the resin and the placing the sheet in the lower die uh, and deforming the sheet by pressing and cooling the sheet under pressure and removing the formed final product after the resin solidified, as you can see in figure one. You can have the uh, schematic production uh, as you can see.
So uh, here in figure two, actually we have the sheet temperature and also press load uh, during the formation. So we have the heat transfer, the formation, and also pressing cooling cycles. Uh, and actually you can see the temperature range, which is suitable for forming the sheets. Uh, so actually uh, this is the uh, schematic view of the thermal press machine. Uh, so we have uh, the uh, die should also be kept closed until the resin becomes solid, uh, such that the sheet shape will be also defined. Uh, the role of the press load is to enhance the fiber resin and layer layer bonding by compressing the sheets. And the bonding the fiber resin and layer layer contacts or voids will occur when the resin become molten uh, because the uh, veidiness of the fiber bundles uh, this is actually usually forced to be straight and become large. Uh, so, uh, in order to uh, actually, um, regarding the methods and also materials that have been applied, as I mentioned, uh, so we have the carbon fiber reinforced polypropylene fabric, which was woven uh, by the plain uh, weave, and also it was cut to 50 cross 50 centimeters. Uh, then uh, we have six layers on top of each other uh, with the warp and bed side being the same, uh, as you can see here in figure four. Uh, then the figures were uh, placed into the mold. And then we have the three uh, cycle recipe that we have for making the heat pressing in order to have the final product, as you can see on the right side in the picture. So regarding the result and discussion, I have to say that uh, regarding the tensile test results uh, for carbon fiber, uh, these um, tensile tests were repeated in three different times uh, due to the standard that you can see here and the average were taken. Uh, and according to the test results, the tensile strength of the uh, CFRP uh, the carbon fiber reinforced composite material was determined as uh, 301.144 megapascal, and the modulus of elasticity was 14.198 gigapascal. So, regarding the glass fiber, again, we had repeated the test for three times according to the given standard, and you can see the results written uh, in the slide. So, regarding the uh, charging is of tests for carbon fiber. Uh, after the notching with the uh, uh, test form, as you see here, uh, we have the notching device. Three different uh, charities of tests were also performed uh, on the device, and the average was also taken against the uh, dynamic stresses. Uh, and you can see in figure five the results of that. So uh, we had also take, uh, we had take the same uh, therapy isot for also glass fiber composite, as you can see here, and also we repeated the test three times. Uh, and uh, then uh, we ha have uh, also reported the average uh, dynamic stress results. So in order to uh, actually conclude, uh, I have to say that uh, the test results of carbon fiber and glass fiber reinforced composite materials were examined. And it was determined that the tensile test and suffered impact test results of the carbon fiber reinforced composite plates also were higher. And uh, it was meaning, uh, and it was really higher. So uh, regarding the acknowledgements, I want to add that uh, we would like to express appreciation to Bursa Technology Coordination R&D Center, uh, stand for Buticom, for their valuable support in performing the test and analysis. And I just want to give a brief about Budicom. It's the uh, Technical Textile and Composite Materials Excellence Center located in Bursa, uh, capital of the province Bursa. It is dealing with uh, uh, performing tests and analysis for all kinds of chemical and also composite materials, uh, and also uh, giving R&D support to uh, companies uh, working on composite materials and also working on technical textiles. So I would like to thank you for your attention. And this was the end of my presentation. A very nice talk by Dr. Mehmet. Thank you very much. You presented your research work very well. Thank you so much. And in case there are any questions, I'm here to ask. No, sir. Thank you very much.
Okay, you're kindly welcome. Now the last presenter of this session is Dr. Muhammad Hamayu Kabir. He is MS scholar at Marmara University. His area of expertise is technical textiles. His topic of presentation is a study on hemp seed oil, polycaprolactone based bone dressing structures by making use of additive manufacturing methods. It's over to you too, Mr. Kabir. Uh, hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, I think uh, my screen is also sharing, right? Yes, you can start. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome you all to today's presentation on a study on hemp seed oil and polycaprolectin based wound dressing structures by making use of editing, additive manufacturing methods. And I'm Mohammed Humayn Kobi from Bangladesh. I'm currently pursuing my master's in the Department of Textile Engineering at Marmara University, which is located in Istanbul, Turkey. And I'm really grateful and honored to be here to present our research in such a great event organized by the National Textile University, Faisalabad. And I would like to thank our uh, teammates like uh, Isan, Irai, uh, Uguzhan Gunduz, and uh, my respected professor, uh, Mohammed Uzun, for his continuous support to conduct this research. So now let's have a look on the key focusing points of this presentation. First, I'll share about the aim of the study and then introduction, materials and methods, experimental results, and a little summary on our project. So moving forward to the aim of the study. So our main uh, aim of the study was to bring the hemp plants to different application of medical textiles, how uh, hemp can be used uh, for medtech as a technical textile, and also to uh, find out the performance of domestic hemp seeds. We tried to design a sustainable dressing using 3D technology. And finally, our main aim is to contribute to the literature in this field. Now, moving forward to a, a small introduction on hemp seed. Hemp is quite popular nowadays, and it is uh, very popular for its medical uh, benefits. The hemp plant is used in many different countries like East Asia, especially in China. So in Turkey, the domestic production has started in recent years. And uh, we, as a part of a project, we also have started cultivating hemp for our uh, different projects. And now the use is uh, increasing uh, for last few years. And in this study, we tried to uh, develop a sustainable own dressing to find out the usability of hemp seed oil uh, in the field of medical textiles. And uh, in this context, uh, scaffolds were uh, produced for a sustainable own dressing. Uh, this study shows that hemp seed oil is a, a natural material that can bring together uh, different aspects or fields of uh, like a medicine, pharmacy, biochemistry, all of these can be combined together. And within the scope of the study, we did several important characterization tests that were applied to the scaffolds, like mechanical test, fiber morphology, biology, chemical, and thermal properties to observe the morphological structures. So before I move further, I just want to give a quick uh, dif uh, difference or a quick idea about, uh, between hemp and marijuana. It's a common confusion uh, between most among most of the people. So the main difference between hemp and marijuana is the THC percentage, which is also known as the tetra, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. So this is the main thing or main component that uh, triggers the narcotic effect. So and uh, THC is one of the at least 113 total cannabinoids identified on the plant. So TAC is absorbed in bloodstream and it travels through the brain, attaching itself to the endocannabinoid receptors located in the cerebral cortex, cerebellum, and basal ganglia. So these are the parts of our brain which is responsible for thinking, memory, uh, pleasure, coordination, and movement. So when someone uh, consumes marijuana, because of the higher TAC percentage, they tend, tend to have a narcotic effect. On the other hand, hemp has a very low THC percentage, which is less than 0.03%, which is not psychotropic and it does not have any tendency of mood altering. So that is why hemp is regulated by FDA and it is approved for industrial and medical uses. Now, uh, moving forward. Here, as you can see, this is a, a visual representation of the use of wound dressing made of uh, hemp seed oil. 
So this is just a simple schematic description of the working stages that we did uh, for producing the wound dressing. So the optimization phase has been completed by changing uh, various parameters for the porous structure uh, like we want in the wound dressing by using 3D printer. So the solution was prepared at a room temperature and initially the production was made with 25% uh, polycaprolactone, also known as PCL and 25% hemp seed oil. But after the production, it was clearly observed that the pores of the wound dressing were closed. So the concentration ratio was reduced and it was fixed at 18%. So after the solution optimization was achieved, the 3D printing parameters were optimized within themselves. So initially the solution pressure was set to 100 and then the pressure was set to 25 PSI. However, under these conditions, uh, the produce scaffold had, uh, had edges, uh, the, the structure of the edges were very thin. And as a result of this, it was seen that the strength was quite low. So uh, it was an irregular structure earlier. So what we did, we reduced the printing speed to uh, 70 and uh, slowing down the printing speed uh, helped us to produce uh, moon dressing, which has a more prominent and thicker structure in the edges. So the device pressure was also set to 15 PSI and the structure was more regular. Uh, our main target was to get uh, an, uh, an structure which will have a clear pores because the scaffolding structure uh, needs to have a tendency to take air and it needs to have uh, extra room for movement when it swells. So this is also another uh, graphical representation or visual representation of the hemp seed oil solution that 3D printer used for this study, the production of scaffolding and finally the produced scaffold. Now moving forward to the results and discussions of our study. So first of all, I'm going to give a, a short idea about the SAM analysis results. So the images according to the SAM analysis here uh, uh, shows that the scaffolds have homogeneous, continuous and bead free morphologies. In other words, it has been shown that the smooth surface of the fibers are preserved in all scaffolding structure types, regardless of the content. And uh, despite the different content of the scaffolding structures, no drops or defects were observed. So these neat and smooth morphologies form the porous network uh, to distribute nutrients and oxygens to the attached cells. In addition, the larger interconnected pores, as you can see in this picture of these scaffolds, uh, facilitate the diffusion of nutrients, which is a must for a wound dressing. And it also helps to promote uh, biomolecules and cell waste products that are crucial for tissue regeneration. It also uh, provides or uh, allows increased water uptake capacity. Now, uh, FTR and DSC analysis test results, as you can see from the FTR test result here, uh, if this test was applied to observe the molecular structure of scaffolds loaded with pure polycaprolactin and two different hemp seed oils. So as you can see, the peak at 2,854 per centimeter and 728 per centimeter are due to the carbon hydrogen stretching. And the carbon oxygen peak at 1,722 per centimeter indicates the vibration of carboxylic acid in hemicellulose. And the intensities observed, there are some other intensities observed in some of the peaks uh, like 1,419 uh, per centimeter, 933 per centimeter here, and also 1,367 and 1,365 per centimeter peaks in the spectra. These are thought to be sensitive to changes in crystallinity due to cellulose. So, and on the other hand, DSC analysis was performed to examine the thermal behavior of the scaffolds. Uh, as you can see, as a result of this test, all samples showed an uh, endothermic peaks at approximately uh, 60 to 80 degrees Celsius. So this situation has been interpreted uh, like as a result that may be caused by the evaporation of the solvent in the structure of the samples. And uh, moreover, new peaks were observed uh, in the degradation of scaffolding structures in the temperature range of uh, approximately 150 to 200 degrees Celsius in pure hemp seed oil. So, from these, uh, it can be interpreted as the higher thermal sensitivity of scaffolds produced from pure hemp seed oil. Now, uh, moving forward to the swelling and degradation test results, these tests were carried out to examine the swelling and degradation behavior of scaffolds in the body. 
And uh, we have used phosphate uh, buffered saline uh, for this test because it has a pH of 7.4, which is close to the pH of the body tissue fluid. And the, uh, that is why this chemical was used. Uh, since the body fluid is simulated for the swelling test, the material undergoes swelling and uh, because it occupies more space in volume, so it can cause an increase uh, in the immune response of the body. At the same time, the excessive swelling of the material may cause uh, stress, uh, stress in the tissue by compressing the surrounding tissues. So degradation plays uh, a critical role in determining how long it takes to degrade in the system. And it also uh, developed uh, depending on the target. So in this context, degradation test was applied to determine the duration of the uh, stay in the body. So normally material with higher mo uh, molecular weight swells in a shorter time. So uh, uh, we have used PCL or polycaprolactin, which has a higher molecular weight. And it was observed that it affected the swelling and degradation after two days. At the same time, this situation also affects the crystallinity of the scaffold. Uh, so uh, since the uh, crystalline polymer chains are closer to each other, so the solvent transition between them cannot be achieved very well. So it showed a lower, uh, longer degradation time. But as we know that PCL is an amorphous material, so the polymer chains are further apart. So water and liquid transition takes place in a shorter time, which is uh, quite okay. And uh, now moving forward to the tensile strain test. So Mechanical uh, tests were carried out to determine the effect of hemseed oil blends on mechanical properties of the scaffold. So when the tensile and strength, uh, tensile and strain tests were examine, examined, it was seen that the elongation amount in, uh, as you can see from this figure, the elongation amount in pure hemseed oil was around 170% and uh, around 110% in impure hemseed oil. So uh, additionally, it was observed that the elongation rate of the scaffold uh, produced with pure uh, polycaprolactin was approximately 230%. So in other words, as uh, oil was added to the structure, the growth rate was a little, a little bit, uh, has, it has a decreasing tendency. So structural uh, flexibility decreased as oil was added. So now uh, moving to the antibacteriality test, in order to test the suitability of scaffolds with different contents for the dressing, we applied the antibacterial test to the structures. The scaffolds were uh, first uh, isolated and then reacted with uh, different bacteria to observe their changes over time. Staphylococcus aureus bacteria was used for this test. So as a result of this test, antibacterial effect was observed on scaffolds produced with pure hemseed oil. However, no antibacterial effect was observed on scaffold structures derived from the hemseed oil that was impure. So from this, it was concluded that uh, purified hemseed oil is suitable for using in a sustainable dressing. And uh, antibacterial property will be higher as the amount of oil increases. So that is all from my side. And I also want to give everyone an uh, interesting fact about this picture. As you can see from this slide, this is the hemp uh, field of our uh, own. We are producing hemp plant here and we are using this hemp plant for our different projects. And we are also conducting composite projects. And we are also extracting oil from these uh, seeds. And that is all from my side. Thank you everyone for listening and for your time. A very nice talk by Dr. Humayu Kabir. You explained your well research work very well. Thank you very much, Dr. Humayu. Thank you. Now we have a short break. Next session will be resumed after 15 minutes.
Okay, excuse me, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Let me know when uh, I should start. Uh, okay, just in a minute, we will be starting. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let's start with the session number three of the day one, ICPC 2022. Uh, the keynote speaker for this session uh, will be Professor Bruno Castani. Uh, Professor Bruno Castani is affiliated with the University of Toulouse, uh, France. Uh, he is a well-known expert on mechanical and structural behavior of composite materials for aerospace industry. Uh, he is the author of several important books and papers focused on finite element modeling, structure and failure analysis, non-linear analysis, and experimental mechanics. Professor, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, okay. Professor, Bruno, okay. Professor Bruno will be presenting uh, today uh, and sharing his uh, insights on the composite sandwich structures in, aer in aeronautic applications. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want also to thank uh, all my colleagues from Faisalabad for, for having uh, invited me. Uh, it's curious, but I can't see you, so I will speak to, to, to my computer. Ne never mind. Uh, so uh, I am uh, Bruno Castagné, yes, from Toulouse, and I will present you a, a short keynote on uh, composite sandwich structure in ionic applications. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, it doesn't work. I don't know why. I don't know why it doesn't go. Okay, maybe. Uh, yeah. Professor, it is, okay, uh, I that's guess okay. Fine. That's okay. I have fine. Uh, I have fine. Uh, okay, so uh, my presentation will fall into four parts. First, I will present you briefly my institute. Then it is necessary to show you some historic example. And uh, I will finish uh, this part by two recent examples, which are linked to our uh, research today. And this is why I will just focus on two parts of uh, uh, ongoing or uh, past PhD. Uh, the first, it is on the PhD of Malo on local buckling. And the second, this is on some crash uh, of uh, sandwich tube with wood core. You, you will see the link uh, after. So just a few words. So we are located in Toulouse. We have a, quite an important laboratory. You can see the building here. We are depending on three ministry, Ministry of Agriculture, Education and Research, Defense and Industry. We have about 100 permanent researchers and about 115 uh, ongoing PhD and our laboratory is a restricted area. Uh, so we are located in Toulouse. You can see uh, the location in France. This is southwestern of France, yeah. This is a beautiful picture of our uh, town with the uh, uh, Garonne River. And Toulouse is well known to be uh, the main plant of Airbus with design offices and final assembly line of uh, 8320, 8330, 8350 and uh, the former assembly line of A380. Uh, in our laboratory, we have many activities, of course, with more than 100 PhD students. And uh, we are working on uh, all, nearly all the subjects linked to mechanical engineering, okay? Uh, we are working on structure, system, and mechanical processes for industrial sector of mainly aeronautic and space. So we have developed original testing mean, I will show you in the next slide. Uh, we are working, for example, on multi-physic issues, for example, uh, lightning strike on fuselage um, uh, and other 
uh, large notch and so on. We are working on different material, including some eco material. It's a more important uh, subject. And uh, I know that my colleague of Faisalabad are aware of it. And we have developed a specific modeling strategy for composite structure, especially for aeronautics. So this is three examples of original means. We have a uh, room for impact with gas gun. The red one uh, is able to send uh, object up to 800 meters per second and 300 grams. This is to study uh, uh, some failure uh, on aircraft. We have an original mean for multi axial testing I have developed. I will show you to you uh, uh, in the PhD of uh, uh, Malo. And this is the last machine. This is a machine uh, MGV for high speed machine. Uh, it's uh, given by Airbus and it is able to make uh, crash uh, studies. Uh, so we have about 130 uh, equipment. Uh, we are in France. We are working closely to the industry, even in the research. And so we have about in my team uh, on composite structure, we have about 62% uh, subject related to the aeronautic industry and 50% with direct funding of the French industry. And we have about 40 ongoing PhD. Okay, so let's move to some historic uh, sample. Uh, in uh, aeronautics. Uh, I have to go back uh, far in the past, uh, just before uh, the Second World War. And you can see on the upper part, uh, French patent of 1934. And it is now we would call this structure an eco structure. But in the past, uh, it was simply a structure. So it's made, uh, it's a sandwich structure with a core core. And you can see it is also drilled. So it looks like a lot to or, uh, on a com core today. And the skin were made with plywood. Uh, so it's uh, quite interesting. And the idea of sandwich structure is in fact quite old. Okay, especially for uh, aircraft structure. Uh, on the plane before uh, we have discovered it, rediscovered it recently, the wings are made uh, with a sandwich made of plywood core and uh, aluminum skin. And it was curious for us because we have redeveloped uh, this kind of solution, but uh, we didn't know it was used uh, uh, 80 years ago. The most uh, relevant example, is this is a mosquito of the Second World War. Uh, it's really one of the best aircraft of this war. Uh, it is all wood made, okay? And it reached 600 kilometers per hour. So it's quite a high speed for uh, pure wood uh, aircraft structure. You can see the manufacturing process on the picture uh, uh, lower. Uh, on the lower part of the slide. And uh, it is uh, quite spectacular because it is nearly a one-shot design. So you have two half fuselage and it is simply bonded and nailed uh, with brass nail, okay? You can see also women who are working uh, on, on the uh, aircraft because during the war, the men were fighting and uh, women were hired to, to work in the industry. And it is still an example for, uh, uh, for us today. Uh, another very interesting example, not well known, but spectacular. This is the uh, XB-70 uh, Valkyrie. It was a Mac, Mac 3 super bomber made by the American to uh, bomb the ocean. Okay, nothing has changed today, unfortunately. Uh, and so because of the speed, the skin temperature was very high. Uh, and so also to have a long range, uh, there was many issue uh, for designing the fuselage and the wing. So the solution, the only available solution was to use sandwich structure. With the core, you have thermal insulation. So it was a natural uh, income for 
um, uh, advantage given uh, by the sandwich. And uh, you have uh, all was made of uh, uh, with stainless steel, okay, with um, brass, uh, uh, brass solution, uh, well, a kind of welding uh, between the skin and the uh, on a com core. Uh, but uh, it was just a prototype, only three samples were made. If we look at the first uh, very wide application of composite and sandwich structure, this is helicopter rotor blade uh, since the beginning of the 60s. So before the use of uh, uh, composite rotor blade, it was metallic blade with a little life uh, only 500 hours. So it was very costly to own helicopter and this kind of blade have to be uh, changed uh, quite often. After moving to a composite solution with a sandwich structure, the composite blade life was su superior to the helicopter life. So it diminished strongly the owning cost uh, of helicopter. And it was really an innovation and it is uh, the first uh, widespread application of composite. One important step in aeronautics, this is the first all composite aircraft, uh, the Beechcraft Starship, which was certified in uh, 1988. Um, so only uh, 73 were produced, 70% uh, uh, about of the mass structure was in the form of composite materials, mainly sandwich structure, and there is many story about these aircraft. It was really a challenge for the engineer, but they succeed with many difficulties. Uh, and this is why it was delivered only four years uh, after the, the schedule expected. Uh, I have given on the lower part the number of tests which were made to make the certification and there is really a lot of testing to ensure uh, and to make the certification. It means to check that the structure is strong enough uh, and is enough secure. Security is the main issue in aeronautics. And you can see the number of coupon level to get the allowable for the design, it's 8,000. Today in Airbus for the last program for the A350, the number of tests reach uh, more than 70,000 uh, um, tests. So it's still an issue when you want to design an aeronautic composite structure. So this is a French German uh, combat uh, helicopter, the Tiger. Uh, it was the, the first flight was in 1991. And to my knowledge, it is one of the most efficient uh, composite structure. The weight, it is 80% uh, of the weight is made with sandwich construction, okay? This is less than 10% of the total weight. For example, it's better uh, than a rocket, than the Ariane uh, rocket, for example, or missile, okay? And this helicopter was certified for crash uh, and it is uh, uh, very strong. In fact, it can be strong and light. And it was necessary to be very light to have a high ascensional speed. So this is the military requirement. Uh, if I move to some recent example, in fact, uh, I don't have enough time to, to develop too much, but today uh, in helicopter and in lightweight aviation, uh, sandwich structure are uh, really uh, the most efficient one. Uh, for civil aviation, for Airbus and so on, it's not really the case. People are uh, uh, designing this kind of large aircraft with stiffness structure. So uh, we are working, uh, we have a PhD with the society, which is Elixir Aircraft. Uh, when they hired our, our students, there were seven only, and now there are more than 100. So the aircraft is certified and it is a all composite sandwich structure aircraft with different one shot part, one shot part. For example, the fuselage is made in one part, the wing also. And therefore, 
the number of parts is very low. For this kind of aircraft, the number of parts is limited to 600. Whereas for a classical aluminum construction, uh, it is more than uh, 17,000. So I will develop some uh, uh, the first part of uh, my uh, research presentation uh, will be related to uh, some study we have made with this uh, society. And we are working with a second startup. The aircraft is not flying yet, but they are developing it uh, uh, today. We will make some tests uh, with them. We are in touch uh, uh, regularly. And in fact, they want to mimic uh, the uh, mosquito design. So they will use carbon, uh, sorry, not carbon, full wood uh, uh, sandwich structure, for example, for the wing and for the fuselage. And so this is a comeback. This is, of course, to diminish the carbon footprint. And they will use uh, Yggdrasil. This is a commercial uh, uh, brand. Uh, it's made with Scandinavian birch, uh, French poplar, ash uh, for the skin, and balsa for the core. And so uh, we have also uh, some study uh, on uh, the crash uh, with wood. And it is an important issue for aeronautics, but also for automotive design. So this is the second focus uh, of my presentation. So now I move uh, it's what uh, uh, our colleague, uh, my colleague from Faisalabad has asked for. So I will just focus on an experimental analysis uh, a part uh, of the PhD of uh, Malo. So the overall uh, purpose uh, of the PhD of Malo this is to define a design methodology, uh, especially uh, for wrinkling. Uh, wrinkling, this is local buckling of the skin uh, of a sandwich structure, and the skin is support uh, by the core. Okay, so you have an interaction. It is a very local problem and it is also a 3D problem. So uh, when you are designing an aircraft, you are making a, what we call a, a GFEM, so a general finite element model. So with all the structural details, including ply drop, uh, details, junction, and so on. But on this kind of model, it is impossible to use 3D models. And even local 3D model. So uh, people are just using shell uh, modelization. And so uh, it's impossible to capture uh, this local buckling. And so this is really an issue to design a uh, full sandwich structure. And uh, sometimes uh, you, when you make the test, if you uh, don't take uh, it into account, you can have a very bad uh, uh, result with premature failure due to this ranking. So uh, we have made coupon tests, but they are not so interesting. They are quite far from the real structure. And so we have moved to a vertex uh, uh, experimental analysis, and I will develop it. So first, the vertex uh, test bench. Uh, I, am, uh, I have made the design many years ago. And uh, the purpose, uh, this is to test aeronautic composite structure under multi-axial loading. So we put the specimen on the central box. Okay, You can see on the left the location of the specimen. On the right, you have the specimen made by Elixir Aircraft. You bolt it to the central box. And when you use actuator one and actuator two, you put the wall box under bending, four point bending. And so you have membrane loading on the specimen under compression or tension. Okay. When you move the actuator three and four, you put the central box under torsion. And so you have shear inside the specimen. Of course, you can combine both. And you can also add a part in the central box 
to have uh, internal pressure. So we have loading, which is quite close of uh, the real loading of fuselage or wing box. So we design uh, a sandwich specimen uh, in the, with the idea to have a central area of interest in which the wrinkling is supposed to occur, okay? For the compression specimen, this is the A, I hope you can see uh, my mouse, okay? Uh, you have zero degree direction and this is a square uh, area. Uh, and then to enter the load, we have ply uh, drops and different uh, density of foam. So it's quite complex, but it is also close to the real design. For shear, we have an area of interest in the form of a, a losange, okay? And because shear means uh, compression at plus 45 and um, uh, traction at minus 45. Or the opposite, it's not a matter of size. Okay. And uh, we are using also uh, an asymmetric uh, uh, sandwich. Uh, I made my PhD on this subject. And so you load the upper skin, which is called the working skin. So it takes most of the load. And the stabilizing skin, this is the other skin is subject to a non-linear, geometric non-linear behavior and uh, doesn't work a lot. So we will have main, all the load which are taken by the upper skin and we will uh, we, we, we expect um, winkling to occur in this part. Uh, when we make a specimen uh, on composite structure, the purpose is, is to capture the failure scenario. And with the vertex test, we have a lot of instrumentation. This is mandatory. So we use several cameras for uh, DIC, digital image correlation, for far field. Far field, this means that we capture all the uh, specimen. And near field, this is that we focus on an area where the, the winking is supposed to occur, to occur. We are using also high speed camera because winking is very uh, uh, explosive, in fact, and also thermal camera. Uh, for this kind of test, it's not really necessary, but for example, for crack propagation, uh, we can capture fiber filer with thermal camera. And we have also had some rosette gauge on the opposite skin, which is uh, hidden uh, and which is inside the central box. Uh, so this is a general behavior. So we have a central uh, uh, buckle. It's not a buckle, it's simply out of plane displacement. And you can see on B uh, the answer uh, under compression. So uh, in blue, you have quite a linear response of uh, the working thing, the upper skin. And in uh, red, you have the nonlinear response of the hidden skin inside the uh, text box, the central uh, test box. Okay, so it's nonlinear, it's uh, uh, classical behavior for asymmetric sandwich, and you can refer to. Uh, one of my old papers. For shear, it is not exactly the same thing. You have a variation uh, in stiffness and the, um, uh, the stiffness, uh, the slope uh, depends uh, on the shear stiffness of uh, each of the skin. And it is almost linear. Uh, you have the strain, the strain fields here. It is uh, taken by the far field uh, cameras. And uh, for the panel under compression, so it's epsilon xx, lower part, you can see that globally it's blue inside the area of interest. And so we have a good uh, 
uh, uh, good compression fit, okay? It is a expected compression fit, that's all. Same thing for epsilon x uh, i. Uh, so in the area of interest, in the losange, you have also quite an uniform uh, shear uh, strain field. So it means that the globally, uh, the test uh, is uh, what we have expected. So now, if you look to the failure scenario, so on figure A on the left, you have the curvature, because with the curvature, we can capture the buckle and the uh, increase in the buckle. And so we have a localization near the ply drop, which is not so surprising. I will explain you later. And on the central uh, figure, you have the evolution. So at the beginning, we don't see a lot of buckle. And just before then, at 99% of the failure load, you can see that the buckle is uh, quite visible. OK? Uh, and uh, that's enough for this slide. Uh, moreover, we wanted to understand why we have this localization. Because numerically, in a perfect world, it should be, you should have the wrinkling uh, all over the area of interest. But in fact, due to manufacturing, you have a small local dent at the end of the uh, change uh, of play, at the end of the play drop. Okay. And you have also this uh, local dent, which is very small. It's uh, just several. Uh, um, dozen, uh, dozen of mi microns. Okay, uh, you have also this difference because you have uh, high density foam and uh, a lower density foam. Uh, so this is a just junction, and this is what we call an imperfection. Okay, and it is uh, buckling, global buckling or local buckling are very sensitive to this imperfection, and it allows to start the nonlinear behavior, OK? And so this is why we have this localization uh, near the ply drop. You can see that for shear, uh, we have less localization, and we have a good, very uh, nice uh, shape uh, with buckle nearly uh, everywhere. Uh, OK. And you can see this is the same thing uh, at the center. Uh, so also, thanks to the high speed camera, we were able to capture the failure scenario. So we have the localization in red, OK, with the very first buckle. Then it propagates uh, uh, perpendicular to uh, the compression direction. And then it spray. So at the beginning, we have just a wrinkling. OK, so we crush the core. Then when it's sprayed, we have a, a, a kind of wave. OK, and we have a second failure of the core uh, in tension. OK, and you can see both uh, after the uh, failure pattern, in the failure pattern after cutting. So on the lower part, you can see the crushed core and the tensile crack. So, for this analysis, we were able to capture the failure scenario. This is explained uh, in our uh, uh, paper, and we have submitted a second paper uh, to the International Journal of Solid and Structure to uh, explain more deeply the uh, computation experimental dialogue. So the, let's move to uh, the compression, dynamic compression of wood. Uh, it is also sandwich, but of course, it's quite different. And we have spectacular results. Uh, and this is why I wanted to show it to you. Uh, so the purpose this is to develop material for crash, to develop security uh, in uh, the transportation industry, both for uh, aircraft and automotive, OK? And to promote uh, sustainable alternative materials. 
So we made many, many tests. Uh, I will submit the five uh, papers on this subject. We have made uh, pure wood tubes, wood uh, tubes uh, made of poplar, uh, oak, or birch. Uh, and then we have also made sandwich tube with a core uh, made of uh, poplar, ven enfin, wood veneer inside. It is just like uh, carbon ply. And uh, to get uh, hoop effect, uh, we have added um, uh, carbon skin uh, at the uh, uh, in, uh, for the inner and uh, outer skin. Okay. Two minutes left. Okay. Uh, so it will be difficult. Uh, so we made dynamic tests. I will just show you the test. Uh, so I don't know why it doesn't work. Okay, so you have this kind of crush. And the interesting result is that if we add wood, we increase the absorbing, the energy absorption. So we have a significant contribution of wood to the crush behavior. So it's quite unexpected. This is not the case for foam or so on. But for wood, it is really significant. And the best result we had, this is that we have seven, we have absorbed 7,000 joules. It means 170 kilo launch at 4.2 meter. And with a tube with birch core and for only for a distance of 80 uh, millimeters. So if we make the comparison with uh, uh, composite or metallic structures, this is far to be ridiculous. We have about half uh, of the specific energy absorption, but for a cost which is uh, more than 40 times uh, lower. So thank you for your attention. And uh, for students, we have also an Erasmus Mondes in Toulouse with other European university, and grants are up to 24 thousand uh, euros. So it may interest Pakistani students who have already won uh, in this uh, master. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bruno. It was uh, uh, great of you uh, that you shared the highlights of uh, your findings and uh, your work. Uh, here we have got one uh, question for you. Uh, there is uh, Mehmet uh, Kupar from uh, Bursa Uldag University, uh, Turkey. He want to ask that uh, that the sandwich composites has uh, find applications in uh, in the area of uh, flying cars or no? Sorry, flying cars. Yes. Yes, uh, I think it's uh, all uh, sandwich made. So the issue are the same that for uh, helicopter or lightweight uh, aviation. Okay, uh, Professor, I have just, uh, uh, I'm just curious about one thing, uh, that in the sandwich composites, you discussed uh, about the the core material, which was uh, mostly polymeric. Uh, what do you suggest about the metallic forms uh, application in uh, aeronautics, like uh, uh, aluminium form, magnesium forms? Yeah, I know uh, this material, but I didn't have uh, me met him uh, in aeronautics. I don't know why. Uh, probably because it is still too heavy. This is the only reason, in my opinion. Okay, so far I have also actually haven't seen any example, but uh, are quite few in the automotive industry for the yeah. moment. Yeah, okay. Probably. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bruno, uh, for you. your time. Thank, thank you. you. Our next speaker is Ms. Kurotulan. She has completed MPhil in chemistry from University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Pakistan. 
Her area of expertise are nanomaterials and polymer chemistry. She has also published one research paper in her domain. Her title of today's talk is Iron Manganese Oxide Nanoparticles and its composite for catalytic and fuel additive applications. Thank you very much, Ms. Kurotolan, for joining us. Over to you now. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. I am Kradlan and I'm here from the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, Pakistan. Today, I am going to represent my research paper entitled Comparison of Catalytic and Fuel Additive Properties of Biometallic Nanoparticles and its Composite. That is iron manganese oxide nanoparticles and the polyanidine iron manganese oxide nanocomposite. Here, dying down there, you can also see the diagram of my research work so that you can the visual um, idea of my work. These are the contents of my slide. Uh, first, I'll uh, study the intro. I start from the introduction. I will uh, then uh, discuss the review of literature that I have analyzed during my research work, then the materials and methods that I performed, the results and discussion conclusion, and then the references. So, uh, what is a nanocomposite? Nanocomposite is basically a, a system which comp comprises of a polymer and a of a matrix and the re re uh, reinforcement. Reinforcement can be polymer, uh, polymers, ceramic, or metal. Uh, I chose the polymer matrix nanocomposite uh, because of their large surface area to volume ratio. So they have uh, I uh, so that uh, because of their the because of the large surface area to volume ratio, they perform better catalytic application. Um, uh, polyaniline uh, basically is a monomer, uh, is made from the monomer of the aniline, which have the, which is a p-type semiconductor, and with conductivity ranges from 10 to raise per minus 2 to 10 to raise per minus 10 semen uh, per centimeter. Uh, the um, um, uh, the conductivity of the polyaniline is due to the delocalized pi electron on the PZ orbital of the nitrogen atom and the conjugated carbon atom. Basically, there are three basic forms of the uh, polyaniline. These are amaraldine, lupoamaraldine, and the pernitrine. Uh, emeraldine is the green colored uh, product. It is a base of the a base form of the polyaniline. And is the most uh, stable and the conductive state. Uh, so I, but the, uh, there are many uh, in the past years, polyanil has been used as a uh, catalyst. But the basic uh, drawback that they encounter is that the fast recombination due to the high conductivity of the polyaniline. So I used as a reinforcement, uh, which is the bimetallic oxide nanoparticles. And so uh, that the, uh, these uh, particles can uh, decrease the uh, uh, efficiency of, uh, can, can uh, uh, lower the conductivity up to the uh, level we wanted because it is tunable. The properties of the bimetallic nanoparticles are tunable due to the synergistic, uh, synergistic in them. Here is the review of literature. Uh, polyanidine iron manganese oxide nanocomposite have been uh, uh, there were nanocomposite polyaniline uh, the nanocomposite polyaniline have been uh, used in various application. Here I my I specifically focused on their catalytic application. So uh, Nagland and all uh, uh, and his co-workers studied catalytic activity of polyaniline graphene nanocomposite, and they re uh, reported that uh, uh, it is an efficient catalyst for the uh, catalytic degradation of dyes like methyl orange, rhodamine B. Uh, then the, and other uh, very important uh, nanocomposite that is uh, anhydrous po uh, polyaniline cerium oxide ferric oxide nanotube have been fabricated. Chigaru uh, and his uh, and his uh, fellows uh, use this composite to remove the fluoride ion from the drinking water. They found out that the nanocomposite removed the fluoride ion effectively within the pH range of 3 to 5. Another polymer matrix nanocomposite that is zero uh, uh, valent palladium and bivalent palladium 
uh, it was also synthesized using co precipitation method and it is used in the carbon carbon coupling reaction it's been found that the uh, uh, the zero valent palladium and uh, bivalent pl uh, palladium system uh, accelerate the coupling reaction while the uh, polyanilin act as a stabilizing agent. Uh, uh, magnetic iron oxide, titanium dioxide, polyanilin, silver nanocomposite have also been formed in which the iron oxide was the core and the titanium dioxide uh, form the shell, they, uh, which was then coated with the polyanilin and uh, layered with silver. This was used to uh, effectively used to remove uh, to reduce the uh, four nitrophenol, and they also used uh, to degrade the methylene blue in the presence of sunlight. Uh, uh, gold uh, uh, spotted uh, uh, polyethylene matrix also been uh, uh, synthesized, which is used for the reduction of the nitro compounds. Uh, and other uh, recently, Nika, uh, uh, Saipo and his co workers uh, synthesized a nickel hydroxide decorated to naphthalene sulfonic acid or polyaniline nan nanotubes have been used in nitro arenes. Next is the materials and methods of um, um, nanoparticles have been synthesized by temperature controlled solvothermal method and then they are incorporated with aniline by chemical oxidative polymerization process using HCl and uh, APS as an oxidizing agent. Um, there is a detailed uh, pictorial representation uh, in this slide. Uh, started from using uh, adding a 30 to 70 ratio of the ethylene glycol and water uh, and uh, twin is added as a surfactant uh, to stabilize the um, uh, precipitates uh, they are magnetically stirred and iron uh, the precursors of iron and uh, manganese were added with the, with the capping gem agent of one point uh, urea uh, urea actually uh, basically used to uh, 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 to uh, to get the specific shape uh, that was required for the application, uh, so urea is used as a capping agent. Then it was autoclaved uh, for one twenty degree centigrade at twenty four hours, washed, dried, and then calcined to get uh, to 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 remove the all uh, all other carbons and uh, other uh, impurities at 800 degrees centigrade for five hours. Then this brown colored product was stored and then it was incorporated in the polyaniline matrix to synthesize the nanocomposite that is polyaniline iron manganese oxide nanocomposite. Results and discussion. Uh, uh, various characterization techniques have been performed to study the Characteristic features of the bimetallic nanoparticles and nanocomposite. Uh, features uh, the uh, 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 the characteristic feature of the bimetallic nanocomposites and null nanoparticles have been studied by X-ray diffraction, scanning transmission, electron microscope, and Fourier transfer infrared spectroscopy. Here in Figure One, the X-ray diffraction pattern of Iron manganese oxide nanoparticles has been shown in the red pattern, while the iron manganese oxide nanocomposite has been shown in the black pattern. Uh, uh, this uh, um, the this XRD pattern uh, confirmed that the uh, nanoparticles were crystalline in nature and they have uh, uh, sharp peaks. While the uh, uh, iron manganese, while the nanocomposite peaks were uh, um, uh, were uh, a little bit, uh, they show the noise uh, because of the amorphous nature of the uh, uh, po polymer matrix. Iron manganese oxide uh, bimetallic nanoparticle has cubic unit cell, while the nanocomposite has the monoclinic unit cell. The FIR analysis. Then I drain my sample for the uh, after-year analysis to study the vibration of the bond and the presence of the functional group. A representative peak at 1543, as we can see here, uh, is the uh, peak that give us, gives us the characteristic electron localization in the emeraldine form of the polyaniline. Uh, the other peaks that are 
the pattern of pick that that is below the uh, 700 nanometer is for the metal oxide a smallest peak a big peak at the 3600 uh, per centimeter wave number shows that the presence of the water molecule uh, uh, in the compound uh, the stem analysis was performed uh, to study the structure and morphology of the uh, nanoparticles and the nanocomposite. Uh, here uh, in the figure three, we can see that the, uh, the polyidene fibers that are long, uh, elongated, uh, thick fibers and form a very dense network. Uh, uh, which uh, they have the porous, uh, por por porous uh, uh, por pores in it, which uh, make them amorphous. And the uh, total uh, average diameter of these uh, tubes were calculated to be the 45 nanometer. They, uh, they are of various length and diameters, but the average diameter was 45 nanometer. Paper four cross ports to the iron manganese oxide by metallic nanoparticles. I'm sorry, I'm to interrupt you, uh, you have uh, only one more minute to wind up the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, the, the this shows that we have uh, uh, the iron manganese and nano uh, oxide by metallic nanoparticles in figure four have the morphology oval shape morphology. Uh, then uh, the uh, iron but the nano composite have them. Amorphous morphology when the rough surface, the applications were performed that are the catalysis and the fuel additive. Various parameters were studied, including catalytic application. May uh, they, uh, the figure six represents the various uh, wavelengths that I have studied to uh, st uh, that I have used to study the dyes. Uh, I uh, took uh, performed the uh, I uh, performed the spec uh, the study catalytic uh, application in the spectrophotometer i um uh, the uh, here uh, the uh, reduction of the dyes followed the long hinchel long mare hinchel wood mechanism that is sodium borohydride and the uh, uh, sodium borohydride used as a reducing agent uh, in the presence of the catalyst and that reduces the dyes uh, nitro compounds into the amino compound and the azo bonds into the nitrogen nitrogen single bond. The reduction depends uh, mainly on the density type of orientation and the presence of the functional group on the dyes. Here is the uh, study. Uh, here is the graphic representation of the uh, plots of uh, absorption versus uh, time, which shows uh, that the uh, there is a comparison of the various parameters. This is apparent reduction time and the percent reduction and the reduced concentration. The K parent versus uh, substrate uh, graph shows that K uh, that uh, 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 poly uh, uh, nano composite have. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, for uh, sharing uh, uh, your findings. Your findings are really very interested, but unfortunately, we have a time limitation that we cannot. Uh, continue for more uh, and other presenters are waiting for their time so uh, quickly we have one question uh, that we have got for you is that uh, do you have any EDS analysis uh, which is important in your case um, actually I don't have because EDX uh, wasn't performed uh, that time the, the, the corona times and the various universities has their system shut down so I can't perform the EDX analysis but I, I have planned to now further proceed for it. Okay, uh, so it is, uh, they're just, uh, a professor is recommending for you that if you uh, continue with this uh, analysis it will be nice for you so here is another question for you that is uh, uh, what is the dc conductivity of uh, these uh, nanomaterials i actually don't perform the conductivity studies i perform the catalytic matlab activity and the fuel additive application that unfortunately i have not time to explain to you but uh, okay. Uh, the uh, the conductivity value that I for, uh, previously provide was I taken from the literature review. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Krotlan, for your uh, presentation and your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Maziar Ahredi. He is doing his PhD under Tubitech Industrial PhD Fellowship Program in the 
Textile Engineering Department of Bursa Uludag University. Uh, his area of expertise are technical textiles, micro encapsulation, functional textiles, smart textiles, finishing, phase change materials, composite materials. Also, he has published three research papers in his domain. His title of today's talk is Comparison of Natural Fibers Properties Used in Composite Reinforcement. Uh, Mr. Maziar, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Christoph, clear. I can hear you. Uh, what about you? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Maziar, for joining us. Uh, we have some time constraint. Please try to complete your presentation within 15 minutes. Over okay, okay. Okay, thank you so much. So I just uh, share my screen and let me make it full screen and just please approve it is, if it is full screen right now. Yes, it is full screen right now. Okay, thank okay. you so much. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to thank you and also the organizing committee for uh, the great uh, second international conference on polymers and composite, and also for your great uh, introduction. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, the objective and the goal of this study was to compare the five distinct natural fibers, uh, which include jute, hemp, linen, sea salt, and banana fibers, as they are uh, recently being uh, investigated as composite reinforcement even more than before. So in order to perform their research, uh, we as a team uh, with the uh, leadership of Professor Dr. Mehmet Karahan, we just made the scanning electron microscopy, a tensile testings, Fourier tra transform infrared spectroscopy, FDIR, the thermogravimetric analysis, TGA, differential scanning calorimetry, and also energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy and uh, Raman spectroscopy. Uh, so uh, regarding the, SAM, uh, the SCM results, as you can see for jute fibers, uh, they are straight and cylindrical, uh, and also uh, they have hollow structures, and also they have some notches on their surfaces, so uh, regarding the hemp fibers, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, the hemp fibers and we, uh, we uh, see that they are rod-like. Uh, also, they have some notches on their surfaces as well. Now, regarding the linen fibers, uh, they are also rod-like and linen fibers have some notches on their surfaces as well. Uh, but the smooth surface of linen fiber provides it more softness than other natural fibers. And this makes it popular in clothing fabrics, particularly for women. Regarding the sea salt fibers, they are straight and cylindrical, and also they have hollow structures, as you can clearly see in figure uh, D, E, and F, especially with the magnification. So the banana fibers are also straight and cylindrical, in, uh, and also they have hollow structures. Uh, these banana fibers are a more practical solution for better moisture management and also air permeability due to their surface grooves that they have. And also owing to their roughness, they uh, cannot be used as a substitute for linen fibers in clothing fabrics. So this is also their uh, drawback or disadvantage that they have. So regarding the tensile strength and elongation, uh, we witnessed that uh, the tensile properties of these natural fibers uh, regarding the maximum force and also the maximum uh, elongation percentage. Uh, the um, linen fibers has the uh, most uh, maximum elongation percentage and regarding the maximum force, it was recorded for sea salt fibers. So, uh, and as you know, the tensile strength and elongation, we can say that it is the capacity of a material in order to withstand the tensile load before failing, uh, it is called the tensile strength. So uh, here we have the tensile strength and elongation. Uh, as you know, that the graph uh, is considered of two different parts. The first part is the elastic zone and the second is the plastic region. Uh, actually, the place that the curve deviates from its intended direction is addressed as the elastic region. Uh, 
uh, sea salt fiber has the highest breaking strength and banana fiber has the greatest elongation. Uh, and uh, actually the sea salt fiber has a larger diameter of thickness than the other fibers as demonstrated in the SEM examination. So as a result, it has a higher tensile strength as well. The hemp fiber has the smallest thickness and uh, diameter among the fibers. It also has the worst tensile strength and for linen fiber, uh, you can say that it has a slightly higher thickness than hemp fiber as a nature, so it exhibits a slightly better uh, tensile strength. In order to characterize the chemical structure of natural fibers, we see that uh, they are consisted of cellulose, hemicellulose, pectin, lignin, and wax in different percentages, as you can see in this table. And also uh, we carried out FIR uh, results so uh, the OH stretching vibration, uh, it is related to the broad peak at 3000 to 3600, uh, uh, as you can see here. And also we have the asymmetric and symmetric CH vibrations from the methylene group of cellulose and hemicellulose respectively uh, at 2900 and also 2850. So we also have the uh, carbonyl bond of stretching vibration uh, of carboxylic acid in lignin or ester group in hemicellulose, uh, which is caused at the peak uh, 1,639. And also we have the methylene uh, symmetric uh, bending in lignin and cellulose and hemicellulose, and also CH symmetric deformation of cellulose and hemicellulose. They are related to the peaks near a thousand four hundred and twenty seven and also a thousand three hundred and sixty nine respectively. So regarding the thermogravimetric analysis result, uh, these uh, curves are consisted of four stages. Uh, the amount of mass that is uh, retained as the temperature rises is shown in the graph as a weight percentage. So for jute, hemp, linen, sisal and banana fibers, weight reduction in the first stage was recorded to be uh, 6.9, 6, 5.6, 6.7, and also 6.4 percentages, respectively. Uh, all of these fibers exhibited this tendency as a result of presented moisture as they have. And also the temperature range uh, where the rate of weight loss reaches its maximum value is how to be when hemicellulose and cellulose start to break down. And also the main weight loss in this case occurs between 148 and also 416 degrees centigrade. So compared to other fibers, linen fiber contains the most uh, cellulose content. Regarding the DSC results, uh, we can see that the evaporation of water uh, from the fiber structure results in a large endothermic peak that emerges between 30 and 135 degrees centigrade. And there is a large endothermic peak because uh, water molecules have such a wide range of binding energies to the cellulose backbone. Regarding the uh, EDX uh, results, uh, we can see that carbon and oxygen were found in all of the natural fibers. And the results reveal that all five fibers include calcium, iron, carbon, and oxygen. So uh, finally, for the Raman analysis results, we can see that the major peaks at uh, 1096 is indicated for carbon oxygen stretching mode of cellulose, but the peak at 380 is only associated with crystalline cellulose and is not present in amorphous cellulose. So in order to sum up and conclude, I have to say that uh, the, sustain the sustainability of natural fiber-based composite materials has led to an upsurge in their application in various manufacturing sectors. Advantages of natural fiber uh, composites include lightweight, low energy production, and also carbon dioxide sequestration, which means that we're using the greenhouse effect, which is very important. Replacement of fiberglass with natural fiber removes the concerns about the potential of lung disease caused by the uh, uh, fiberglass and is a, a move towards sustainable development. And also the natural uh, fiber-based, uh, natural fiber reinforced composites have uh, developed significantly over the past few years uh, because they, are, they have ease of production, lower density, high specific strength, and also renewable nature. So uh, there is a thing that we have to pay attention and it's that the interfacial attention 
uh, with a scientific matrix should be improved with suitable surface treatment operations. And also it is very important uh, and noteworthy to create a good interface so that the applied stress can be transformed from the matrix to the fibers. So I would like to um, thank you and express the gratitude and appreciation to Busa Technology Coordination and R&D Center for their valuable support in performing the tests and analysis. And I want to especially thank my colleague, uh, uh, the PhD candidate of automotive engineering at Bursa Ulag University, Mehmet Kopar, uh, for his kind support and uh, for his uh, time during this uh, academic works that we are doing together. So thank you so much for your attention. And this was the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mazia, for your great presentation. Uh, we have no question from the audience side, so we can conclude this presentation and move towards the next. Thank you very much, uh, Sir, Mr. Welcome. Thank, you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Majid Ali. He is currently working as assistant professor in Rifa International University, Faisalabad campus. Her, his area of expertise are physical and computational chemistry, also, he has published five research papers in his domain. Uh, his, his title of today's talk is Green Composites for EMI Shielding Applications. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Majadari. Can you hear me? Dr. Majid, can you hear me? Please unmute your mic, Dr. Marit. Please unmute your mic. Okay, Dr. are Marit. you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marit Ali, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, okay. You can share your slides as well. Okay. Uh, are you watching my slides here? Not yet. आप इसको मैसेज करें कि इसके बाद आप uh, okay, so we have, uh, uh, I guess, uh, got some problem uh, by Dr. Majid with his connectivity. So we will continue for the next speaker. Maybe after that, uh, Majid can join us. So our next speaker is uh, Sakina El Kadwai. Uh, she is affiliated with Bioresources and Food Safety Laboratory, Faculty of Science and Technology, Ghazi Ayad University in Morocco. She is a PhD student and has yet, and has yet uh, in the third year of uh, PhD. So, uh, Ms. Sakina, uh, uh, are you hearing my voice? Okay, uh, so please continue the presentation. Hello, everyone. I'd like first of all to thank the organizers of this international conference on polymers and composites. I would also like to thank the other members of the jury. Let me start by saying just a few words about my background. I am El Qadawi Sukino, a PhD student of food science and natural substance at Qadayyad University in Marrakesh at the Faculty of Science and Technology. As you can see, our topic today is about a part of my study titled Exploration of the Desert Locust Chisosarca gregaria as a Chitinous Source.
The Desert Locus is bred in certain laboratories with the aim of constituting an alternative source of proteins to remediate the nutritional deficits in the world. The rejection of the breeding at the various stages can be also valorized by the production of chitin. In this work, we were interested in the adult locus in order to explore it as a chitinous source. The chitins extracted at different levels will be transformed into chitosins according to different processes. All the products prepared will be characterized by different methods, analytical and spectroscopic methods. The insect stages belongs to the order of Orthoptera and more precisely to the genus Schistocerca and species Gregaria. The breeding and the reproduction of the desert locust were carried out in the biology laboratory under the direction of Professor Hamdawi respecting conditions like light, photo period, temperature and food. Studies on chitin have been carried out in particular on crustaceans and cephalopods, and a few studies have been realized on insects. The interest of our study is the exploration of desert locust as a chitinous source to evaluate not only the quantity of chitin, but also the quality of chitin that it contains. Chitin is the second most abundant natural polymer after cellulose, consisting of a sequence of N-acetylglucosamine monomers. It is a major structural component of the exoskeleton of invertebrates and the cell wall of fungi. It is found in three physical forms, alpha, beta, and gamma chitin, which differs according to the arrangement of the sheens in the crystalline regions. When the degree of acetylation is greater than 50%, the copolymer is practically insoluble in diluate acid solution and corresponds to chitin. The more the degree of acetylation is less than 50%, the more the copolymer is soluble in solution of diluate acid and the name of chitosan is attributed to it. Chitin and chitosan find important application in different fields due to their many biological and physiochemical properties as an example, non-toxic, renewable, biodegradable, biocompatible, antifungal and antimicrobial effects, and they have ability to be functionalized. It represents one material but different application in wide range of fields including medicine, agriculture, food, environment and others. And now let's move on the preparation of the raw material. The first step is the separation of the locust body into five parts, heat, thorax, abdomen, legs, and wings. As you see in the picture, the five parts are separated. The second step after separation parts is eyes and waste removal, then washing each part, following by oven drying, grinding, and finally, saving to have particle with diameter between 1 and 2 mm. After preparing the raw material, we will move on to the extraction condition of chitins. We have adopted the extraction principle described in the work of Ptolemy and Ghazi et al. 
This process is very efficient and based on the principle of repeated baths of demineralization and deproteinization of low concentration. For the low cost, we have confirmed that it is not necessary to proceed to the demineralization step. So, the proteinization step was carried out directly by using a concentration of 0.3 m of sodium hydroxide. The use of a concentration of 0.3 m of sodium hydroxide generated a large number of bats which may impact the chitin contents, which lead us to retain concentration between 1 and 2 m for all chitins. This passage not only makes it possible to reduce the duration of the treatment, but also to reduce the losses observed between the treatments. After extraction, the raw material of each part represents chitin contents. Therefore, the contents of chitin varies between 10% to 12%. And now let's move on to the characterization of chitin samples. We have confirmed by infrared spectroscopy, X-ray diffraction and CPMAS NMR that all chitin's extractor presents an alpha chitin. The infrared spectrum shows the characteristic bands of chitons, in particular the band of first amide, which divide completely, contrary to beta chitin, only one band of the first amide is observed. Then, the chitin diffractogram is characterized by two crystalline peaks which appear around 9 degree and 19 degree. This analysis makes it possible to calculate the crystallinity index, which is a quantitative indicator of crystallinity. We analyzed the diffractograms of different samples prepared in our laboratory in order to compare them with the low cost. It is clearly observed that the two diffractograms of squid and cuttlefish are superimposed and present a beta chitin. In contrary, the diffractograms of pink shrimp and locust are superimposed and slightly shifted for the first two. This result shows that the locust has an alpha chitin. To confirm this result, the prepared chitins are analyzed by CPMAS NMR. This is an example of chitin from the wool body. We observed the signals relating to the carbons 3 and 5 around 73 and 75 ppm, which is characteristic of an alpha structure, unlike the beta structure where a single peak corresponds to these two carbons. An elemental analysis for chitons was carried out in order to determine the contents of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and other elements, as you can see in the following table. Also, we have determined the molar mass of all chitons from different parts by viscometry method, which varies between 540,000 grams per mole and 850,000 grams per mole. And then we calculated the indices of crystallinity of chitons by the air method, which varies between 54% for thorax up to 72% for the whole body. And now we will move on to the preparation of chitosan. Chitosan samples were prepared according to the Brusignac process in Idrius Media and Curita process in Aqueous Media. And now let's to move on the characterization of chitosan samples. 
First, we determined the molar mass of all chitosans obtained, which is generally lower than that of chitons, and we observed that the molar mass of separated parts is less than 20,000 gram per mole, contrary to the whole body that represents a high molar mass. The following figure shows the different viscosity curves of chitosans prepared. This result shows that the molar mass of the whole body of the locus is greater than that of the separate parts. Then we determined the degree of acetylation by different methods. It is desirable to use more than one analytical or spectroscopic method. So, it is very important factor that give us an idea of the solubility of chitosan in diluate acid solution. For this, it should have low degree. As you see in the table, in a duration of 4 hours, the degree of acetylation was determined by acid-base titration, infrared spectroscopy, and confirmed by NMR analysis. As a result, we had a low degree with perfect solubility in acetic acid solution. The following figure shows an example of an acid-base titration curve of a chitosan after 5 hours of reaction with a degree of acetylation of 6%. The second figure shows that the degree of acetylation of the heat chitosan decreases with the reaction time. This is an example of NMR spectrum of a wing chitosan. The calculated degree of acetylation is 10% after 5 hours of reaction according to the Brosignac process. We have established a study of the evolution of the acetylation for 24 hours to the skeletons, and this for analyzing the behavior of the reaction which differs according to the source of chitin, in particular during the first hours. Take as an example the whole body chitosan. We have a degree of acetylation calculated by acid bias titration of 12%. Whereas, for this same duration, we obtained a chitosan from the legs with a degree of acetylation of 6%. In the case of the curita process, two phases were observed. The continuous curita process, during which the deacetylation is very rapid, and the repeated bad curita process, during which the deacetylation is very slow. These results show clearly that for alpha chitin, the continuous treatment is more effective than that of the repeated bad. Unlike the study by Firdaus and all on beta chitin of squid, the curita process with repeated treatment is more effective. As you can see in this figure that represents chitin and chitosan. A decrease in absorbance is observed in the spectrum of chitosan in the amides band because it becomes more deacetylated. The X-ray diffraction spectra shows the difference between chitin and chitosan. The chitons and chitosans show the interesting structures. For example, the chitin of the head, which consists of thick fibers well bended, with the presence of an interesting porous structure at the chitosan, favoring its application as heavy metal keratin agents.
and scientific research has no limits. After preparing our chitons and chitosons, especially chitosons that are destined to the application with a specific degree of acetylation and specific molar mass, we can proceed to evaluate the microbial, antifungal and antiviral effects of different chitosons. We will also proceed to applications of these chitosons having low molar mass in the medical field. And also we can synthesize of biomased material from different chitosons and evaluate their effects in a specific area. Uh, thank you very much, Sakina el Kadwai, for your uh, presentation and sharing your work. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Khadiji Senam Shash. Uh, she is uh, she has got PhD degree uh, in processing of composite materials from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of uh, Delaware, USA. Uh, she is currently working uh, in the University of uh, uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Abdullah Gul University, Turkey. Uh, Adiche is expert in modeling and control of composite material manufacturing processes, material characterization, permeability and rheology, and porous media flow. Uh, she has several publications in the in her expert areas. The topic of presentation for Khadija today is uh, the future of composite manufacturing with automated automated fiber placement challenges and opportunities. Uh, thank you very much, Khadija, for joining us. Uh, the mic is all yours. Hello. Uh, I, I think uh, you're see seeing my screen and hearing me well, right? Yeah, we are uh, hearing you very clear and loud. Thank, thanks thanks again for uh, for this organization and making me part of it. Uh, so uh, I, I really enjoy your talk, like oh, the presenter's talk. Now, last but least, stage is my, mine. So thanks again. So today I will be talking uh, talking about the future of the composite manufacturing with the automated fiber placement with the challenges and opportunities and including uh, my perspective. So this question uh, came into my mind with this uh, Composite World uh, magazine. So it is asking the Composite 4.0, which is introduced as the Industry 4.0 uh, for the composite industry. It's the future or the fad. So I really suggest this article. And at, at the end of the article, the author suggests that the Composite 4.0 needs the research 4.0. So in order to facilitate the industrial needs towards the composites, including the manufacturing material characterization, covering all the value chain, we need to develop research 4.0. So that's my that, that was my lesson learned. So uh, with this research 4.0 and the composite 4.0, it's promoting the uh, recently popular composite manufacturing tool, automated fiber placement. So this automated fiber placement is one of the effective and fastest, which promotes the actually automated composite manufacturing. So it enables manufacturing composite, uh, com uh, composite parts with complex geometries, with different lamination layups, and with high performance uh, applications addressing this uh, space or aerospace grade materials. So with uh, this AFP machine, we have this robotic arm, the individual toes tapes are coming and you play, you place it, compact it with the compaction roller and with the heat source depends on your material, either laser or uh, infrared technology, you apply the heat and then consolidate your material, lay up your material in your desired perspective. So this is what the uh, automated AFP uh, placement device does. And the advantages is it promotes the automation towards the industry 4.0 composite 4.0, so it enables repeatable production. You can come, come up with thickness variations as you want, and you can uh, play with the orientations, ply orientations, not only in the true thickness, but also in the in-plane direction, and you can efficiently use your materials. However, 
this equipment uh, investment wise is uh, uh, like cost costs a lot. Uh, and also there are some inevitable defects which happens throughout the uh, manufacturing and this head which do the layup is uh, generating some restrictions because of the angles because of the uh, limitations geometrical limitations and uh, when you want to do an aerospace grade material co compare it with the hand layer process to form the pre-preform, -pre it, it can also be counted as a relatively slow process. Uh, but the market is calling to uh, like uh, alerting us about the huge interest in either AFP or automated tape placement or automated fiber placement. So in the market, uh, so in 2020, there was a drop because most of the investments in performed in 2019, but the future is alert, uh, which is an uh, uh, alert saying that there will be more need, more purchase uh, investment in those, of, in those devices because the material uh, suppliers are also tailored their products according to those uh, devices. Uh, so, History wise, uh, the AFP A or ATP devices are not new. They were uh, in the market like 50s and 60s. So uh, in the 50s, 60s, uh, filament winding or automated type tape layup was there. But as the time passes, the market grows, grows, grows. And recently, the trend is more usage of the AFP with minimum, minimal or controllable defects throughout the layup, and especially with the recent trends towards the thermoplastic composites, advanced thermoplastic composites, can we ensure in-situ thermoplastic layup uh, right after the AFP layup, can we get a final um, high quality composite parts is the question of the future. So where we use those materials in the recent stage, so this is a couple of a couple of market, a uh, couple of articles that I, uh, sorry, just can close the chat. Okay. So uh, automated tape placement products are currently used uh, with the Airbus or Boeing for the fuselage for the large parts of the uh, Airbus. Uh, but still those usage are requiring a secondary consolidation, either autoclave or hot pressing right after the AFB layup. But the market is growing, uh, especially aerospace, uh, aircraft, even autom automation, uh, automotive areas are using the AFB as a uh, final product uh, technology. With the AFB, like, like the... Uh, most of the composites you can have your composite either with the thermoset matrix or thermoplastic matrix the thing with the thermoset matrix is it's already proven and uh, the value chain is over there uh, you uh, people developed uh, uh, necessary literature regarding to the elasticity or the uh, final uh, requirements and it is it has been using over the large part production but thermoplastics are promoting the cost effective uh, effectiveness especially enhanced impact toughness and uh, uh, following the recent trends or uh, like europe U european union uh, trends the recyclability can be achieved with thermoplastics and one another thing with the thermoplastic matrix is they don't have uh, shelf life so storage is not a problem and you can work with the more void free parts and you can go with the high pressure and high temperature uh, processing and servicing right so thermoplastic is uh, promoting itself uh, and with the thermoset resin matrix uh, those are the applications it's okay it's, they have well-known uh, advantages but it's not being recyclability, so you cannot uh, satisfy the demands regarding to the nature, uh, like uh, nature needs, sustainability needs. But with the thermoplastics, you can you can achieve it. With the thermoplastic, also for the aerospace industry, we have those peak PIEC uh, blends, which uh, promotes the high performance. Uh, aerospace grade material. So they, with the thermoplastic resin and the AFB device, they came together with those high performance uh, materials to be, to tailor the uh, 
feature needs of the aerospace materials. Also with the AFB device, you can do the dry fiber placement. Uh, that's also a, a possibility that's also promoting the complex ch shapes and also um, uh, you can make your preform with a high level of heating, better tension control. So you can also promote the better uh, liquid uh, composite molding processes with the by preparing your preform, dry preform with the AFP placement, automated fiber placement. But those are the challenges. So the challenges with the AFP is the most current challenge, which needs uh, like more attention is the layup time and also uh, tool preparation, operator break, and uh, inspection and evaluating the data and inevitable defect formations are the other challenges. And uh, checking the feature, uh, you can uh, save, you can uh, solve the layup time by the optimization problem. So most of the uh, most important challenge in the feature can be solved by a smart uh, manufacturing, smart uh, layup uh, procedures. Uh, also with the AFP device there, during the layup, though, uh, there are inevitable uh, defects, gap overlaps, uh, pucker, vehicle. So those, study, those things are also inevitable, but, and it is also uh, one uh, problem that needs to be solved towards the movement of the uh, composite 4.0. Uh, in order to do that, in order to deal with this problem, people are generating both in situ and uh, passive control mechanisms to encounter, to observe those kind of toe tape defects. Uh, and the thing is now trend is to uh, building uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning approaches uh, to solve the problem right after the observing the uh, observing those kind of defects. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, the automated fiber placement uh, can be handled by four steps: design the layup, uh, come up with a successful processing strategy, and uh, you, your process design should be successfully manufactured by using the digital tools, maybe digital twin or smart data collection tools, and also uh, do the uh, inspection, uh, in-situ uh, inspection or passive inspection tools to, uh, to make a comment about the success of the process. In this uh, center, Sabanji University, we have a center, integrated manufacturing center, which we devote uh, our research on the composite manufacturing. And in this center, we have this AFP device. Uh, this AFP device is purchased from the French company Coriolis. And with this device, we can do thermoset, uh, both thermoset and thermoplastic and dry fiber placement. And we are performing processing window studies. And also uh, we have a well equipped material mechanical characterization. And with this mechanical characterization, we can also do non-destructive techniques like DIC thermography or acoustic emission and in a uh, coupled manner, even further understand the failure mechanisms. So uh, today I will be talking about a couple of research activities that we performed in this center regarding to the processing and its integration with the manufacturing uh, along with the inspection uh, tools. Uh, but first thing that we have to do is understand the physics of the process. With this AFP layup process, uh, we have this compaction roller and raw material is coming. And this thermoplastic raw material has a rough surface. And with the laser heat and the consolidation process, we are just like having a more smooth surface. And the smooth surface uh, coupled with this uh, compaction roller is um, eliminating the in interlaminar voids and promoting the healing and the cr crystallization. But there is a risk of void growth and the degradation and also residual stress built up. So those are the uh, physics and the issues regarding during the AFP layout. So in order to come up with an integrated solution, 
what we do is we couple the physics of flow through porous media, heat transfer, and the consolidation physics by being able to understand the material, including the fiber, resin, and process parameters. So that's an integrated process design recipe that we developed here. And of course, the material itself is, uh, it is the essential part. So for the material, we should develop the process parameter process design. So for the material, we need to understand the fiber architecture. It is permeability behavior in the through thickness and the in plane and the fiber volume fractions. As a thermal property is the thermal conductivity and the specific heat capacity is a prop, um, parameter uh, that we need to understand along with the resin rheology and the degree of bonding. So uh, being able to understand it and how things change during the process is the essential part to come up with a successful uh, process design. So uh, especially with this laser assisted thermoplastic AFP process by trying to achieve this in-situ consolidation, the question, uh, the uh, problem with the composite 40, we need to first understand the temperature distribution during the AFP process. So this AFP process challenges that, as I mentioned, they are going to like a risk of thermal degradation. We need to ensure uh, successful bonding and the crystallinity is important and it's basically uh, important uh, linked with the cooling rate after the process. So we need to align tune uh, the AFP process parameters, but how things change with the effect of the fiber orientation and uh, correlated with the degree of intimate contact was one of the uh, gap in the literature that we figure out. So in order to understand it, we develop a thermal model. So I will just quickly introduce our thermal model. It's basically calculating the thermal contact resistance between the layers, meaning that the gaps in uh, between the layers are also changing a lot regarding to the thermal conductivity, as we know from the fundamentals of heat transfer. So when we are uh, making our design, we are using this thermal contact resistance, which includes the raw material degree of intimate contact. And um, in uh, process in intimate contact, meaning that the, for the raw material with the pro, uh, profilometer, we are measuring the surface profile and turning it into a, a mathematical model to encounter the uh, degree of intimate contact of the raw material. So this is my initial degree of intimate contact. Then I make samples with different process parameters and with different layup configurations with my AFP device and measure the intimate contact after the process. So for uh, the, uh, all the thermal models in the literature are assuming perfect bonding. So they are they don't include the uh, final intimate contact and thermal contact resistance. And as you can see, during the layup temperature profiles change a lot with accurate degree of final degree of intimate contact. So we also check the different ply orientations and how the degree of uh, intimate contact change after the process. And we place this final intimate contact as a, a parameter in our thermal model. And we validated and we uh, recently published this uh, in, uh, we published this uh, effect and how things are changed and how the temperature profiles change to, throughout the layup, which also changed the degree of crystallinity as a a performance indicator of thermoplastics. So uh, the governing equations are prepared uh, as a uh, 2D flow, 2D uh, heat flow. And we also consider the rate tracing by playing with the absorption parameter uh, and with the assigned boundary conditions, we had a chance to successfully validate it with our thermal camera. Uh, which is placed it on the tip of the uh, laser head at the nip point. So after validating the temperature, we managed to get the thermal profiles uh, with different speeds. So 100 millimeters second is a 0.1 meter per second is a well accepted uh, layup velocity for the AFP device. And you can see how uh, accurate degree of intimate contact, final degree of intimate contact is changing the uh, 
ter thermal profile, meaning that actually uh, with this thermal uh, thermal contact resistance, with higher fly orientation changes, we are going to have a drop in the therm temperature. So that, that might be one of the reasons of having um, lower degree of crystallinity or lower fusion bonding mechanisms uh, with this uh, experimental data. Also, we want to things to be uh, performed in a very fast manner. That's why we also check the higher speed and with the higher speed, we also observe the same effect. Uh, so now with this thermal model, uh, we show the importance of the thermal contact resistance and we experimentally validated our tapes and also uh, we link our uh, values with the degree of crystallinity and we have a uh, matching results and uh, currently this study is now lean to characterization of the uh, numerical modeling with the experimental validation for the uh, bonding strength uh, for the uh, AFB fabricated composites. Uh, and additionally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the thing, the challenge with the AFB right now is you people are using the AFB just for the layup. But the feature is asking to get the for the AFB device to give them the final product. So what people are recently doing is after the layup process, AFB layup process, they are using this expensive uh, autoclave or hot press process. It takes minimum eight hours for the co finalizing the consolidation. So uh, our aim is to reach the in-situ consolidation at, uh, at the end, but our first pit stop was replacing this expensive autoclay process with uh, with an out of autoclay process by vacuum bag only process. So, with the study uh, that we performed by playing the layup velocity and the compaction force, we played with the uh, we made an in situ consolidated parts and measured their void fractions, and we took the samples and perform the autoclave. And as you can see, autoclave is ensuring the uh, good enough void fractions. Then we check the vacuum bag only process with two hours of pre-evacuation vacuum hold times. But as you can see, the after the in-situ going with this vacuum bag only process with just two hours of uh, developing time, just uh, enabled the void growth mechanism. But by playing, by changing the uh, vacuum hold times and making it to uh, 24 hours, we managed to get with the uh, high velocity and the low compaction forces, we managed to get better uh, parts, better, better void fractions compared to the autoclave with the vacuum bag only processing. But the thing is here, we didn't just like uh, say that let's try the 24 hours. This 24 hour is obtained by an air permeability measurement for our samples for the in-situ consolidated samples. And then by getting the air permeability and measuring the enough time to get the air removal through the part, we tailored the uh, we engineered the uh, vacuum hold time. So uh, additional to this, we are also working on uh, aging of those parts. And we uh, also using this thermoplastic composites in service lives with uh, hot well hot uh, hydrothermal aging process and with our uh, multi instrumental tools, starting with the AFB manufacturing and perform the aging and the tensile tests. So our tensile tests. Uh, said that the aging doesn't affect the high performance thermoplastic composites, but when we couple it with the acoustic emission, when we couple the tensile test with the acoustic emission, we had a chance to observe the uh, change in the failure mechanisms for the uh, fibers, which more prone to fiber pull out after the aging, thanks to this uh, multi-instrumental tools that we have. So those are the uh, some glimpses, some studies that we performed within the center, and we are acknowledging acknowledge the funding from our national funding agency to be talked. And I would like to also thank my uh, SUIMC team and my colleagues here. 
So I would like to take your questions if you have any. And as a process engineer, process design uh, scientist, this is a uh, inlet and vent to model the liquid composite molding. And that's how I make my question mark. So thank you again. So uh, I would like to hear your questions and comments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Khadiji, for uh, sharing your findings. Uh, it was uh, very nice to hear about uh, all these new uh, research work so, of you. Sorry, sorry, so, it was a little bit fast. I would like to say a lot. So, uh, hope uh, you can you, you can also email me afterwards if you want to get any detailed information regarding the things that I uh, mentioned. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you. So uh, quickly, uh, I have uh, to share a couple of questions from audience. Uh, the first is that. Uh, do you see any uh, difference in the mechanical properties behavior uh, when you produce composite uh, with the in situ AFM uh, fabrication or uh, after autoclave uh, curing? So our recent study, uh, like this one, oops, okay, okay, this one. So with this one, those are the. Uh, I can't see my screen. This so is those, about uh, void fraction. This, this one is the void fraction. So yes. those void fractions are directly linked with the mechanical properties. So if you have a lower void fraction, you are going to have a better uh, performance. And additionally, with the uh, autoclave and the vacuum, the heating process is also facilitating the increase in the degree of crystallinity, not only void fraction, but also degree of crystallinity recently is higher for uh, right after the secondary process. So the autoclave vacuum bag is decreasing the voids and also increasing the degree of crystallinity for the thermoplastic composites. So in situ recently cannot uh, achieve that level of uh, mechanical integrity. Okay, thank you. So we have got another question from Dr. Ayub Azhar. Uh, from National Textile University, Faisalabad. Uh, he want to ask that, uh, can AFPM, that is Automatic Fiber Placement Mechanism, work in vacuum? Uh, unfortunately, no. So this is a moving hat. So this is just like uh, uh, working uh, tape by tape. So uh, unfortunately not. You After finishing the layup, uh, you can implement the vacuum uh, vacuuming. Uh, and uh, so he says that uh, he's adding that if the whole setup is placed in a vacuum uh, atmosphere, will it work? Um, it would be like a very huge device. So it will it, it wouldn't be very effective if you are just uh, making yeah. not so great, uh, not so great okay. parts. Okay. So Maybe that he's... would be really nice. But this is a very huge device that we have here. So it is. It it can work with three uh, one three meter diameter and five meter long parts. Okay. So he has uh, another query that uh, uh, do you have uh, found any example of uh, automatic fiber placement for uh, the placement of fabric layers? Woven fabric uh, layers. So. Yes. Um, the thing is, uh, you can play with the angles and you can make, uh, but the in plane wise, like you cannot uh, braid it. It doesn't work like a braiding machine that you you yeah. cannot make those uh, twill or plane weave, those kind of things. So it's, uh, it is working in the in plane and you can play with the, you can steer the fibers, but you cannot uh, go like warp, of, warp or wefts like the traditional bones. Okay, Khadija, out of curiosity, I want to uh, ask something. Uh, you suggested that there are some problems with the automatic fiber placement at the moment that is voids, uh, degradation and residual stresses. But you can uh, like uh, uh, see you are working uh, when uh, you are in fabrication, like in situ fabrication. So there are investigations that you can check uh, during the in situ fabrication. Uh, that you suggested. So what techniques do you suggest uh, that we can inspect the process uh, during incentive uh, situation? 
So especially with the laser heads, we are going like temperatures like 400. So whatever we do is it should be compatible. Any technique that we uh, implement is uh, it needs to be compatible with that high temperature. So no one can be in the room during the layup. So that's uh, that's one thing. And any smart mechanism, uh, it cannot get the uh, true thickness void content. So if you have any defects like uh, like this, like I introduced during the layup, like wrinkle or gap overlap, those kind of defects, they can they can be observed and they can be prevented throughout the process. There are some uh, things in the University of South. Carolina, I guess. So, uh, so the Fergurdal uh, team is working on those kind of mechanisms. Uh, but uh, regarding to the void content, uh, in situ consolidation, it needs to be coupled with the physics and mathematical relationships. Okay. So, uh, last question from our side: uh, Is the products produced with the automatic fiber placement mechanism are uh, currently used uh, for commercial purposes or not? Like in aerospace industry? Aerospace industry, yeah, they have been using uh, Airbus, Boeing, they have been using uh, AFP for their industrial applications. Um, and uh, recently there is no flying part, up to my knowledge, with the in-situ consolidated uh, composites, okay. but with the AFP layup and the um, uh, autoclave or hot press the uh, either spaces industry uh, yes. using that technology okay thank you very much Khadiji, for yeah. your time thanks for your uh, thanks for this opportunity and <laughs> thanks for uh, this great organization most welcome uh, so with this uh, presentation we will be ending the session for today and uh, we will be uh, joining back tomorrow at 9 30 a.m uh, sharp. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh,